Hello and welcome. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Silvana Masella. Uh, some of you know, already know me. I'm the uh, coordinator of San ICT, CEO of Trust IT. And whilst we wait to welcome the over, we hope, 165 registra registrants that have uh, registered to today's intense three hour, very packed agenda. Uh, we'd like to say, first of all, thank you to all of you uh, for coming on and, and uh, having uh, having dedicated some of your time for these three hours, which is an extremely crucial to, uh, time in our January. And it's super that we managed to put this together in record timing. Um, if perhaps maybe we can already show the um, housekeeping slides so we can go through um, the agenda very quickly. So we're starting at two, uh, the session one is defining standardization needs, priorities and contributions provided at the European level. Uh, we go on um, with four sessions in total. We also have a leg stretch and a coffee break. And then we have an open discussion. What we'd like to do is also have some main takeaways and uh, wrap up after. So the if we go to the next um, slide, so some housekeeping, it, this webinar will be recorded, which is great. And we, there are some presentations, not many, but they will be available to you all um, after. We encourage you to use the Q&A box um, and you can also follow the chat that you see on the right. And what we do want to say is we wanna be as pragmatic as possible with uh, Stan ICT with these three hours. There is a high level forum on standardization taking place on the 20th. So in real time, and it's thanks to all the esteemed panelists we have already on the agenda, we have already structured a synthesis document with some recommendations and reflections that are going up to go in there already based on the discussions that are going to happen here. And we hope from those of you who are also who have also registered online and we'd love to hear your feedback and comments in the Q&A and in the chat. And within 24 hours, we are then going to put this report together, send it up over to the European Commission and hopefully um, it can be a useful document to help the high level forum um, standardization event taking place this uh, this, 20, this 20th of January. OK, moving on then with that. Um, I am delighted to have with us to open the future standardization education uh, webinar, Helen Kopman, Deputy Head of Unit at Digital Innovation and Blockchain at the EC at DG Connect. Um, thank you so much, Helen, for joining us. And she will be giving um, an overview on the defining standardization needs, priorities, and contributions provided at the European level. Um, I do also want to add that this is a joint effort uh, between different DGs at the EC. So thank you very much, Helen, and also Thomas and Emilio and Carlos, uh, Antonio, Gergi, uh, Raquel, who are always really supportive on efforts going on. There is a, a lot more that will be going on in future. And what we'd like to see from an effort such as this is that we don't move off into siloed activities and we can always try and come together and know exactly what's going on from the standardization point of view. The priority here is on education. And with that, I'm going to pass the floor over to you. Thank you so much, Helen. And ha let's have some great insights the next three hours. Thank you, Helen, over to you. Fantastic, Silviana. Thank you so much for that uh, introduction uh, and, and welcome to everyone uh, online and people joining still. Um, I just uh, would like to give you a short uh, you know, backdrop to why we have this meeting. And of course, this is, as Silvana said, very much a collaboration between uh, uh, DGs across uh, the commission. So DG, DG uh, RTD and DG Grow as well. Um, so I'm in, uh, representing DG Connect, which is the liaison of, and, and you know, the DG in charge of uh, the project stand ICT organizes this, uh, this event today. But just to, uh, for everyone's information, I mean, why we have this is, 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 is a clear, uh, concrete action following the standardization strategy that we issued in February in commission. And 
uh, with that also the um, uh, new actions that were outlined in the strategy. For instance, the creation of the high level forum that Sivana just mentioned. Uh, and this will put much more focus on the importance of standardization activities and the objectives of them. So indeed, one of the, the key objectives of this strategy uh, that was set out is to ensure future standardization expertise, uh, the need for education and skills. And this is because the evidence suggested a lack of standardization expertise, uh, even uh, a limited strategic approach for using standards for legal compliance, for instance, to market access or general business strategies. And the adop adoption of strategy uh, identified this gap and the need to step up education in standardization. And it comes very timely, as we see very much the geopolitical importance of standards also increasing. Uh, um, and the efforts of uh, other regions uh, stepping up uh, their presence in, uh, in global standardizations. For instance, China, it's putting forward a very sophisticated program, program, investing a lot of resources in actions, such as integrating standardization courses in university degrees and peer-to-peer -peer mentorship programs for professors in a very strategic uh, um, uh, effort. And to ensure the future standardization expertise and support for our position in, in EU as a global standard setter, we need to uh, deploy uh, dedicated standardization models in, in, in for business law and engineering degrees to integrate them in the curricula. Uh, and we also are doing uh, standardization in university days uh, to deploy initiatives for young researchers and networks from Horizon Europe and Euratom, including COST. Um, and we also want to use, use the Commission's EU Academy platform for this dissemination of uh, standardization and, and learning material around standardization. So these are a few examples. Uh, we also have a concrete call here, uh, which is published uh, under Horizon Europe called Provide for a Strong and Sustainable Pool of Experts for European Standardization to Attract Students, uh, Attracting Students from University. And this action is, is uh, increasing, well, the objective is to increase visibility of standardization in European universities and higher education institutions and provide a pool of European professionals that are ready to contribute to standardization on international level. And there will be one project uh, funded for this, uh, for this call that is open right now. But then also I would like to uh, emphasize a little bit the, the link between r and and standardization, which, which is crucial. Uh, the EU standardization la landscape depends very much on the innovation capacity uh, of its industrial ecosystem and, and not the least in the digital sphere. So uh, in this sense, we also have seen with the pandemic and the energy crisis we just go through that excellent science really can create value for society in, in a timely manner. Uh, and it doesn't have to be as long a uh, process uh, as we sometimes think to come from uh, idea to market. And to increase the competitiveness of our industry, linking standards and research, it's really vital for European companies to strengthen their position. So uh, in addition to the, uh, the strategy that was set out by the, by the Commission, the Competitiveness Council has also adopted a recommendation on guiding principles for knowledge valorization. They did that in December and they identified standardization as one of the very important ways to create value from research results. And these guiding principles will be supported by the code of practice for standardization, which provides recommendation at uh, institutional, for example, university RTO level, project level and policy level. Um, this uh, code of practice will propose a set of recommendations on how uh, beneficiaries of, uh, of public r &I programs can best identify opportunities and techniques to valorize their project results through standardization. And the adoption of this code of practice is, is foreseen in February. There will be an awareness raising campaign also uh, accompanying this code of practice. And we, uh, we invite everyone to uh, engage and be part of this campaign. You can do this by, by filling out an EU survey uh, by the 23rd of January. And uh, there will be more uh, information about this by my colleagues in RTD uh, that are part of this event. Uh, I would also like to mention uh, some of the ongoing activities that are already out there. And that's about education training. That we, we definitely not are you, you starting from scratch. So today we have the European Academy for Standardization called URAS. This is a community promoting standardization, education and training. 
and they organized a yearly international conference on standardization and innovation in uh, information technology. And you can get involved here, as well as we have the past joint initiative of standardization with Etsy and San Senlec that developed specific material for learning on standardization. And I think you will hear about this also later today. But uh, back to what the, the essence of today, today's workshop, uh, which is uh, promising, you know, very, very good and in, important material for all of you that uh, are here. We are really happy that Stand ICT project seminar today will give you this uh, overview and, and, and feed you this material so that you can more easily digest and get, get engaged with it. Um, this will uh, be complemented complemented by sharing experience from experts uh, also joining today. And uh, some of these experts were funded through the Standard City uh, support action to help them participate in standardization uh, development, uh, where, for, for example, sufficient financial resources were not available in the university or company they, they, uh, they belong to. So these experts will, for example, explain how technologies such as digital twins blockchain, 5G, AI, or digital product passports are impacted by standardization. They will present challenges and propose very interesting recommendations for you that will help you in this work. Uh, the EU Observatory, for example, identified in its landscape report more than 250 potential relevant standards in the area of digital twins. Uh, but to, in order to ensure broad adoption of that, we need uh, to be less, to be less practical use case driven uh, standards development process happen and a much more collaborative approach, which is also the purpose of the, 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 this seminar today. Uh, we think that the ICT professionals must be on in the focus of the standardization discussion as they are key, really key for the development of future standards. Uh, the speakers today will also highlight the importance of ensuring wide adoption and correct in, implementation of standards and encourage entrepreneurs to keep in mind existing standards when they develop their ideas very early on in the process to ensure interoperability, access to market, and avoid reinventing the wheel as well. Well, uh, with this, I will finish my introduction. I hope that everyone now is comfortable, seated, uh, ready to enjoy this um, seminar. Uh, I would like to thank you, uh, all the panelists, for um, joining today, participants as well and especially the Stand ICT team for organizing this workshop. And I wish you a very fruitful exchange. Back to you, Silvana. Thank you very much. Lovely, Helen. That was great. Thank you very much for that bird's eye view snapshot on uh, what's going on also amongst the different DGs. I think that that was uh, highly relevant. And you will see in the chat that a lot of uh, flurry of activities and URLs are indicated. Uh, in there, so please do take advantage and, and, and download that information. Maybe just a point, if I may add, on, on, uh, on Stan ICT. Uh, I said I wasn't going to say anything because Ray is, but I, I will. Just uh, the perhaps diversity of Stan ICT and how it's sort of changed over the years, Helen, if I may add, that it's quite a specific CSA that it's moving with the market. So if something is necessary, because um, the market is banging on your door and wanting to work on a certain type of um, technology. And we've seen this recently with the digital uh, dig digital product passport, digital twins, etc., where the landscape reports are coming on to that. Now, these weren't written in the contract. And I think this is a, um, I don't want to say a success story, but how we've seen uh, in practice how CSA can be uh, agile also in its approach and because it's necessary otherwise why would we be, why would we bother doing that and I think this is some it's a lessons learned for new CSAs coming under Horizon Europe that perhaps what's written in black and white uh, might clearly change uh, due to market constraints and I think that's that's extremely important okay so with that thank you once again Helen we're moving on to uh, session two, a snapshot of some key European standardization activities and their main achievements. And it's nice because, as we've said earlier, there are different projects that are being funded around standardization. There are going to be even more under the Digital Europe program and Horizon Europe. And it's nice to be able to make sure that it's a, we adopt an inclusive dialogue with everything that's happening here. So I'm gonna pass the floor now to 
Nicholas Ferguson, my colleague, he's also senior project manager uh, at Complan. He's the coordinator of one of these initiatives called the hsbooster.eu. So with that, thank you and over to you, Nick. Thanks very much, Silvana, and uh, thank you for the for the very interesting introduction there, uh, which really gave a good uh, overview of what's happening in Europe in terms of uh, educating standards, and 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 is a nice backdrop to what we're going to discuss today. So I've got four special speakers uh, who are going to really uh, take stock of their activities in standardisation, and in particular in increasing education and expertise. So Silvana mentioned that um, the HS Booster project, this is the European standardization booster, which, which I'm, I'm the coordinator of. Um, and this is playing an important role as well. We have a, a training academy uh, here uh, within our project, which will be discussed later on in, in today's event. So these are exciting times and there's plenty of things already happening, both from a standards development organization point of view, and also from a European project point of view. So we have four very interesting uh, panelists. I think your, your, your cameras are on. Um, first of all, we have Yuriko Asen Sao, who is Deputy Director of EWF. And we also have Ray Walsh, who's Assistant Professor at Dublin City University and involved with the Stand ICT uh, project. Yuriko is involved in the Stand for EU project. So these are two key funded projects uh, funded by the European Commission, which are focusing on standardization in different areas. So we'll be hearing from them both on, on, on an ICT perspective, but also uh, in, in terms of best practices from, from other sectors as well. I'm also joined by David Boswathek, who is the Director of New Technologies at, at Etsy, and Livia Mian, who's the Innovation Project Manager, uh, Manager at Sentinelink. So these are very important people very important organizations obviously in terms of identifying needs and challenges and uh, actually addressing standardization uh, directly so uh, with that i'm going to ask uh, each of the panelists just to give a, a very brief introduction to themselves and uh, to highlight one key activity in, in which they're involved with and given this is a stand ict webinar i'd like to give the first advantage to ray who will, who will kick things off. So Ray, over, over to you. Uh, thanks very much, Nick. Um, I hope I, my my mic is on now as, I, as I'm speaking. I forgot to check, but yes, it is. So um, yeah, my name is Ray Walsh. I'm a, I'm a, a strange individual because like, I, I, I span academia and industry and uh, research as, as well. So um, uh, actively involved in the Adapt Research Centre in Dublin City University, as you said. And involved as a partner or coordinator in Stand ICT, HS Booster, Adra E, and, and various other projects around um, standardization, standardization the ecosystem development, and um, supporting uh, the next generation of standards experts. I'm an editor for ICT standards for artificial intelligence for the joint uh, joint technical committee uh, between um, ISO and IEC. And uh, Get in, I'm involved in the strategic advisory group for Sensan like JHC21 as well for developing standards. But my main my main focus here would be to support the Stand ICT project, you know, which is a, a key project in uh, in in developing the ecosystem, standards standards ecosystem, uh, and in, in in terms of education and engagement. Thanks, Nick. Excellent. Thanks, Ray. That's a, it's a very comprehensive overview, and you're, you're certainly involved in plenty of plenty of things so an extremely active uh, uh, Ray here so I'd like to turn to to Livia now uh, who's who can give us a, uh, an overview of her, her role at Sense and Sense and Thank you Nick and good afternoon to everyone my name is Livia and I work as project manager in the innovation team of Sen and Sanalek Management Center which is the common management center supporting the SAN European Committee for Standardization and SANA Life European Committee for Electrotechnical Standardization. And I'm also secretary of the joint SAN SANALEC group called STEER, which stands for Standards Innovation and Research, which uh, has been active for more than 10 years now as the main focal points for any matters related to integrating standardization, innovation, and research. And this group is chaired by Professor Knut Blind, who is also going to be one of the speakers in today's event in one of the later sessions. 
the challenges I'm facing in my daily activities are on one side to raise awareness about standardization and attract researchers and research project into our system. And on the other side, to ensure that uh, our European standardization system is ready to address innovative topics, uh, engage with research actors and responding to an increasingly rapidly innovation piece. So that's in a nutshell, and I will let you uh, introduce the other speakers first. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to, I'd like to go to David next because, of course, he's representing Etsy. So I think it's nice that that he uh, gives an uh, his overview and introduction from an Etsy perspective. Yeah, thank you, Nicolas. Uh, good afternoon, or well, possibly good morning to some people. Uh, my name is David Buswardik. I work for Etsy, Director of New Technologies, which is basically the innovation department. In Etsy, we have a one-person innovation department. I'm always very envious of Sense and Lexa, multi-team uh, innovation department. Um, my principal activities are threefold. One is link is linking to research, so research and education, European research, national research, and international international research. So what's happening in Europe, SNSG, Horizon Europe, and others. What's happening in the UK, France, Germany, Spain, Portugal. Can we get that research into standardization? What tools can we put in place to help? So education, uh, information, guidance, that's always the very big thing where people need to know where to go and how to get involved. Um, break it, basically breaking down the mystery of standardization to innovators and researchers who may not know what we're doing. The other aspect is future technology mapping. So we try to look at all the different trends of Telecom, telco, ICT. Now we have a technology radar to do that, which looks at the top 10 or now, in fact, it's the not top 21 trends, AI, blockchain, um, digital ledgers, um, various things, uh, satellites, such things, and, and the impact that those future technologies or evolving technologies could have on standardization. And then the other one is bringing all that together and hopefully welcoming new work into Etsy or work welcoming new work items into existing groups in Etsy or even other standards bodies. So one, two, three is what I do. Excellent. Thank you, David. That was that was great. And you you raised a couple of little points which I think will be interesting for the for the for the rest of the session. And last but not least, I'd like to hand over to Yuriko and uh, for him to give a, a, an introduction to his uh interesting uh um angle here in this panel. Hi Nick, thank you very much for the for the introduction. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Just a very brief introduction to myself. So my name is Rico Sonson. I'm deputy director of EWF. Uh, EWF stands for the European Welding Federation. We don't just do welding anymore, and we are quite different type of association. We are an European industrial association focusing very much on training and qualification of personnel for the manufacturing sector. Just to give you some numbers, we award around 40,000 diplomas uh, worldwide related to qualifications for manufacturing. And because they are aimed at manufacturing industry, big part of the training that is given is dedicated to standards and standard implementation. So we are very much aware of the importance of standards, especially in the manufacturing environment. Um, adding to that, EWF is also a liaison organization to summarize and send thank you committees. If we do training, we develop training, we need to make sure that we are aligned with what's coming out in terms of standards. And I'm personally, I'm also a convener uh, and a national representative of Portugal in some ISO committees, as, as, for, as an example, ISO, ISO TC261, which deals with IT manufacturing um, standards. Adding to this, and part of the discussion that we and the activity that we have is trying to make sure that we can uh, are able to connect research and academia to standards. And I, I also am an invited professor uh, at the Portuguese University, where I struggle every day trying to convince my colleagues the importance of standardization in educating the future engineers. So that's why I, I think I, we we do cover we do a, try to address both sides because they are different languages, and this is the type of activity we also carry out. Excellent. Thank you very much. That's really interesting. In fact, we're gonna we're gonna stay with you because the first question is going to you because it's very interesting. I remember when I first saw the, the stand for EU project and the various um focus areas you were looking at, one of them was welding, and I thought, well, I wonder why. And then you, you explained to me in preparation for this uh, that you know. It's actually a highly standardized area. And uh, in fact, 
in manufacturing as well, there's plenty of best practices that other sectors could perhaps uh, learn from. So could you um, could you go, go into a bit more detail on what, what the ongoing activities in, in manufacturing standards are? Thank you, Nick. So uh, I was I actually had a bit of a speech to prepare for this question, but I'll go the other way around, which is uh, actually a very interesting thing that we have when we talk about standards for manufacturing is that you, ha you have different levels of maturity of the standards. Like you mentioned, welding standards has been around for decades. So industry is completely aware of them, already knows what they, what they are about, and is not very much willing to big changes. Even if they, they always are updated, they always are uh, kept, we keep working on them to keep them aligned. But it's a, a completely different ball set because we are talking about standards that are already very much in the market and industry is already using them on a day-to-day -day basis. But then you have the other extreme, which is uh, new technologies, new processes, new uh, materials that require new standards. And I gave, I gave an example in my present in my introduction, which is, for instance, additive manufacturing. If everyone likes additive manufacturing and likes standards, this is the perfect place to be now because it's much more quick to develop. It's much more uh, proactive in terms of development. It's much more changing on a constant uh, daily. And this is uh, becomes a bit of a, uh, of a different, completely different type of challenge. And this is very much what we're trying to do in the Stand for EU project. So we're trying to connect research and uh, industry, uh, looking at also this type of maturity level of the standards. Do we, are we talking about uh, uh, standards that are very much solid like you mentioned already, very much considered as best practices, or we are looking at a new technology, a new process that actually needs heavy uh, lifting in terms of standard development to make sure that industry uh, has enough has enough information in our standards that are very much guidelines that can support them in implementing this new technology or new, these new processes. So this is very much what we're trying to do in Stand for You, connecting these two realities. Uh, but also trying to connect these two uh, these two different worlds, which is research and standards development, because they have their own language. Each one talks in a different way, and this is what we are actually trying to make sure that we we address by also allowing them a, a quicker identification of which standards already exist that they can look at to, to carry on their research and identify the gaps so they can also focus their research on uh, providing inputs for standardization bodies to develop the standards that are needed to support industry. Okay, fascinating stuff. So, so you know, it really depends on the maturity of the standard in the sector and how much effort is uh, and the types of activities you need to, you need to use to be, to be educating and also changing the standards. So if we turn now to the ICT field, uh, Ray, with the various activities you're involved with, Stan ICT, uh, Adria E, as well. Can you can you give a, a quick overview of of how similar things are there and what what the what the landscape there is 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 like? What's going on there? Yeah, I mean it's a it's a an emerging uh, um, as as well as it keeps we got we're in our third iteration of Stan ICT now at this stage, and we keep growing and growing, and uh, it's a uh, it. it it has sort of three pillars that 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 it that it builds on. First of all, it's the it's got the um the the funding um through the grants platform, which which means we actually actively support researchers and 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 developers and stakeholders to engage in standardization by by supporting their 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 standards activity specifically if they're in a leadership role and and want to to become an editor or a a, a chair or a convener of a, a working group etc uh, within the standardization um uh, uh ecosystem uh, and the second pillar of of the uh, standard ICT platform then is 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 uh, the technical working groups to the European observatory for ICT standards and they do lots of 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 work on behalf of of um, Stand ICT in terms of the landscape reports that Silvana and, and uh, her trust IT uh, colleagues have referred to already. Those landscape reports are a huge effort which involve hundreds of experts coming together to look at the AI landscape or the IoT landscape or the digital twins land landscape, edge computing, smart cities, and to to give an up-to-date um, state-of-the-art representation of what the landscape looks like um, internationally in that in that specific area. And we find these being very useful doc documents. And also the funded uh, funding that, that goes to what we call our fellows, the Stan ICT fellows, we 
track that in terms of 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 checking to see where that money goes and what is the impact of that that funding. So the fellows uh, generate reports after each open call and we're, we're up as far as our ninth open call now at this stage. And the the fellows impact reports are published on, on the Stanley City website as well. So it allows people to get a flavour for what other activity is going on um, at the moment within within the, um, the Stand ICT uh, ecosystem of, of um, uh, standard support mechanisms. And also the last pillar, the, so the third pillar is the academy, which is uh, looks at, at, at bringing together a, a standards training and education material from, from various sources, from, from national standards bodies and European standards organization and international standards development organizations as well. And, and annotating that and making it available through the Standards Academy, the uh, the U.S. Standards Academy, where you can get access to um, foundational or you know beginners uh, standards material, just an introduction, or, but also more uh, more intermediate and advanced levels where we have there's books generated by Etsy and 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 various other 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 um, forms of 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 collateral like videos and and online courses etc which uh, are are delivered and can be accessed through the um uh, the, uh, the academy link as well so that's that's a flavor for what stand ict is involved and and through the technical working groups as, as as Sylvana mentioned earlier it's a very agile mechanism for 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 spinning up a new area of emerging technology and bringing a group of experts together to, to look at the landscape in that in that area and see where there may be potential gaps in relation to standardization. Um, I think that's probably enough for, for the time being because uh, there's a, there's far more that can be said on HS Booster and Adri as well, but I'll give other people a chance to come back in. Thanks, Ray. That, that's great. So, yes, very interesting. There's a flow of information from the experts um, involved with standardization series of documents in terms of identifying priorities and recommendations. So uh, I'll, I'll turn to Livia now. Now, of course, the, the, there are plenty of priorities and plenty of urgencies, such as uh, within the, the with regards to the uh, artificial intelligence and standardization uh, request from the European Commission. So uh, I wondered if you could give a bit of insight on in how SEN and um, deal with this and the types of activities um, which you're doing, the, the outreach activities in particular to the research community. Yeah, sure, thank you. So in San Sanalep, we organize uh, different type of outreach activities targeting the research community. For example, each year we organize a series of stakeholder engagement workshop, and we have specifically an action we carry on since a few years with the Commission Joint Research Center, which is labeled as putting science into standard. It is, is a sort of foresight on standardization exercise. The latest edition of the workshop we organized was focused on data quality for AI, specifically looking into data quality for ensuring uh, unbiased and trustworthy and ethical AI. And this workshop we organized was an opportunity to hear from AI practitioners and research what are the critical points that they face in their experience in using AI models and launch a discussion on how standardization can be used to mitigate bias in AI model. Since we think that creating a stronger engagement of expert in AI into standardization is essential to contribute to the development of future standards to support deployment of AI into the market and also in line with the European Commission priorities for AI and to support the development of the standards that will be needed to reply to the standardization request and which will be addressed into SANS Analec Joint Technical Committee 21 that deals with AI standards. Another example of event we organized, uh, not really focused on AI, but can be still relevant for the community that is gathered today, is an event we organized last December, which was looking into Trusted Chips and the Chips Act. And then not specifically on the field of AI, but more in general, we have a variety of tools and materials that explain standardization to the research community. For example, we have a dedicated website called uh, standardplusinnovation.eu, which is a dedicated learning that explains standardization process to the research community. And of course, we welcome very much the different initiatives that the Commission has started to support the link between research and standardization, such as the HS booster that you represent, Nick, and also the code of practice, which is going to be published in February. And we very look much, very much look forward to work with the Commission on the awareness, awareness raising campaign to disseminate as much as possible the code of practice and make it really a valuable tool to explain standardization to the research and scientific community. 
Excellent. Thank you. Yeah, and that, that collaboration with, with San San Lec is, is is really important for the for the uh, for the Horizon Results Booster. Um, sorry, the the, the standardisation booster activity that, that that I work with, and it's the same with Etsy. The collaboration that's is really important. Uh, and I've been to a couple of their events, and there's one just next month with the research community in Sofia Antipolis, which I'm looking forward to. So, David, can you tell us a little bit more about? The types of uh, education and training and outreach that, that Etsy carry out. Yeah, thank you. Well, there's quite a similar to Sense and Lake. We do quite a lot of things for the research community, for the innovation community, and for the students in technical education as well. It, it's difficult to know where to focus, but going back to the event, which will happen on 6 to 8 February, uh, about two or three weeks, that's a very good example. So Stand ICT will be there, HS Booster will be there. Um, we'll be welcoming 27 European SNSJU projects um, who will actually do their launch there. So the whole, whole point of that event is, is getting projects, researchers and standards engineers into the same meeting area and getting them to network. So obviously you want to make sure that in research, the projects consider standardization when they put in their project proposals to the commission for approval. And when during that project, we want to be there alongside Sense and Luck, alongside others, to be able to advise them on what are the base standards they could use, how to best consider standardization, and when the project is complete and mature, where to put the, their research and innovation work into standardization. And that could be Sense and Luck, Etsy, ISO IC, 3GBP. ITF, ITRIP, it can be any standards body, but one of the key areas we need to treat is educating researchers, which are a completely different communities to standards engineers, completely different community to the people operating telecoms networks. We need to educate them about the value of standardization, and that's something that will come back repeatedly in this day, how individual researchers universities public and private research centers can get value and that can be money that could be knowledge that can be fame that can be ipr and patents how they can get value by interacting correctly with standardization um, examples would be um, on the snsju projects which are basically beyond 5g 6g um, a lot of those will be looking at evolving 5g technologies so a lot of the standards already exist all they need to do is be modified but the the projects need to know where are those standards how could they get involved who do they need to talk to so we see ourselves as a sort of uh, advisory service anybody who has a question about standardization where to go how to get involved how can i get my contribution to the meeting who do i need to talk to all of those are really simple but can be blocking points to getting interaction um so we're really there to advise uh, etsy's got a website uh, etsy.org slash research where everything is there we have the event coming up which is really designed to do this education and information the only other one i don't want to talk too long very importantly and it, it relates to this so you have uh, information education and then you have education about standardization until that end in etsy alongside sense like we've done understanding ict standardization principles and practice which was a big 700 page of a massive uh, guidebook published in 2018 revised in 2022 um, and that is available online it can be purchased also there are slides which can be downloaded and used by any university professor who wants to have a little segment on what is standardization how are the legal aspects what about ipr and patents and all that's available for free in addition what we've done we can actually go to universities and if they want us we can sit down with them for two days and give lectures so that's more about the education point of view so there's lots to be done uh, we can't do it alone, so this is why we, we enjoy working with Sense and Lec, HS Booster and Stand ICT. But the important thing is to have a coherent message to the research community at every opportunity. Okay, that's very, that's very important. I think, yeah, like you said, you know, the projects like Stand ICT and HS Booster and Stand for EU are all uh, useful um, channels, if you like, to to the to the research community because we're actively um engaging with them that's our that's our job if you like so uh, if I, I like to go go back to ray um so you have quite a, you know, interesting roles in, in different uh projects and it, it's key that these standardization engagement activities are important um, and what what do you think are the best ways to engage with uh 
on on standardization. Um, if you could give give a give a bit of a, a view on that. Yeah, sorry, sorry, Nikki, I was on mute. Um, yeah, I think I think actually one of the ways we just mentioned the CSAs uh, um, earlier in, in terms of their uh, contribution, I suppose, in, from it's, a, it's it's obviously it's funded through the European Commission, and I think they're a good platform for bringing many many uh, collaborators, uh, potential collaborators, and uh, a, a large number of eco, um, uh, stakeholders together in, under the one roof, uh, and, and this is one mechanism. I see uh, uh, for sort of removing duplication, increasing collaboration is to bring as many people to get to, together under various in initiatives. And the technical working groups from San City was one way of doing that. And, and HS Booster does, does the same in terms of bringing together lots of experts, which are which can be uh, allocated to um, and funded to support uh, Horizon projects, like you know across lots of lots of uh, sectors. So it's not just ICT, um, but it's it's by bringing. You know, the Commission, the national standards bodies, the European standards organizations, the international standards development organizations, you know, uh, people from academia, from research centers, you know, from industry, uh, as many people together to make the best standards possible, like, you know, to, 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 to create uh, this globally accepted, this, this international consensus on the best way forward in, in, in terms of how to shape um, whatever uh, technologies area that, that you're that you're dealing with, but uh, and to create foundational standards and, and uh, more targeted standards in that space. So by bringing those communities those communities together, and these have their own ecosystems. All of these 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 are large groups, and bringing them all together on the, under the one roof um, via a, an instrument like you know Standard City or HS Booster or Adra E is is one way of doing that. And I, I think that helps to remove silos to remove. Uh, duplication of effort, like you know, where we have where Etsy and Zanlake and and Stan ICT with, with other experts and other stakeholders and uh, are are collaborating together, like to 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 develop the next generation of of standards. And an example of that that's happening currently at the moment, like is where you can see that the the AI Act, which is um, uh, has been. So, uh, issued like via a standardization request to the European Standards Organization, is been is been developed. You know, standards standards have been developed to support that that regulation um, uh, via the Joint Technical Committee uh, in uh, in uh, JSC twenty one in in uh, Saint Senelec, uh, with the support of of, of the other uh, ESO and and uh, uh, other experts. So you can see where the Act, uh, the Euro the AI Act in this instance, like you know, has been. Is, is gaining legs, it's going through a consultation process, it's been developed by experts, and that expert community is growing, and as, ma as many stakeholders as possible has been engaged in that process, so it's, it's not just the research centers and research projects and uh, universities, but but also startups and SMEs, and, and we need to expand that out to consumer groups and citizen groups and government services, and uh, uh, to come up with as many many mechanisms of uh, me mechanisms as possible, where that collaboration and that coordination happens happens at, with the widest stakeholder engage engagement as possible. So to, as I said, to re re remove or, or at least reduce the duplication of effort. You know, so when we like for example, I, San ICT has, has generated seven landscape reports in the game already, and and this is something that's done on a regular basis, and we're supported by San San like we're supported by Etsy and and I IET and W3C and, and ISO and IEC in, in doing that. And it's a one way where, where we can jointly deliver something that's useful to the whole ecosystem. Thanks, Nick. Excellent. Thank, thanks, Ray. That's uh, it's, it's a great overview. And there's so many, with so many players, not just in Europe, but also internationally, it, it clearly dialogue is, is really important. So uh, I'd like to turn to uh, to, to Yuriko. Um, now, uh, you know, having having uh, quite a different perspective, if you like, from the manufacturing side and different experiences. Uh, what's your experience of actual uh, implementation of training for standardization? Um, in terms of also in terms of considering the aspects such as certification and, and qualifications. Well, Nick, when we talk about in, let's, uh, industrial qualifications, industrial training. Uh, standardization training on standardization implementation is a must 
So we, uh, we, uh, uh, I started by introducing a bit of WEF. I mentioned that we award uh, 40,000 diplomas to personnel uh, well, uh, um, at an annual base. It means that over uh, half a million already. And there, there isn't a single person that has one of our diplomas that was not trained in standards implementation. So when you look at industry, it's, it's a, it becomes a must. So you need to be aware of standards that exist. If you want to be able to provide to the market a uh, quality product, but also to, if you want to have market recognition. So part of the training that we do always tackles uh, standards. And this is uh, picking up on your words, Nick. Uh, this applies for both mature uh, processes, but well as new processes. So our background is mainly on welding. So most of the training we do is on welding professionals. All of them are aware of standards. We currently also develop uh, implementing a training on additive manufacturing, which is a, a bit more recent uh, a process compared with welding, this part still has a, a couple of years already under its belt. But when we are actually ask industry what type of training they needed, the first thing that appeared on the top of the list was standards training on additive manufacturing. So this is definitely something that industry asks for. It's a must. And uh, we do. We would like to see that this actually being a bit more rolled out on, on, into universities, into research centers, because we also need to have people that are coming out of university aware that standards exist. So, like I said, it's definitely a must. Excellent. That, that's really good. So, I think David, you kind of covered uh, how Etsy are addressing this already. I think you really touched on that with, in terms of the research with the research community. So I'll, I'll come to you with another question in, in, in a moment, but um, it would be interesting, Livia, if you could uh, you could give us an overview of, of what Sensenelec is doing to try to get researchers more involved. And this is obviously uh, an objective of the, the standardization booster to really try to um, get obviously more people working in research projects involved with standardization and, and also trying to connect them up with experts who can tell them, well, actually, there are standards which already exist, which you should be using. So, uh, Livia, what, uh, can you tell us a bit more about the work that Sam can do? Yeah, sure. Of course, we, re we recognize that input from research and innovation are, are key for the development of standards and of our system. So we want to make sure that input from researchers are welcome and that also we recognize their contribution. So on one side, we are providing a sort of uh, um, advising role. So researchers are welcome to approach us. We have a specific uh, research help desk where we try to help research and mainly research project to get in contact with the relevant technical committee, find out what are the current standards published in the field and we try to help and advise them. On the other hand, when it comes to the part of the recognition, uh, we want to make sure that researchers are recognized for what they deliver to standardization. So with that purpose, we launched five years ago uh, an award scheme called Standard Plus Innovation Awards, which celebrates the contribution of researchers and research projects to standardization. And I'm pleased to see that one of our previous award winners is one of the speakers in today's event. And we are also currently looking into option for making available online the bibliographies of San and San Alex standards publication so that this would allow uh, researchers to show when uh, their scientific papers have been used as, as basis for the development of the standards. And we hope this can make them more encouraged and more willing to contribute to standardization as a way also for them to progress in their career. Excellent. Thanks, Livia. So, um, so that they're really important things. I think having the the, the the researchers understand the value for them within their career, uh, in terms of progressing and, and being citable and being cited in, in in standards as well as it would be important an important value. And uh, David, you touched a bit on this uh, in terms of how you uh, communicate value to research, as you mentioned, IPR and, and, and patents. I wondered if you had them. Um, if you had any more uh, examples where where this is where where this has been um, successful, or maybe not examples, but experiences uh, in terms of bridging that gap uh, between uh, the, the education and and involving the the researchers. Yeah, thank you. Well, there these are really very separate but related tasks. Um, what uh, Livia said was very interesting. Um, Etsy 
is also trying to find ways to make researchers feel more at ease, more welcome, more recognized, and, and this important value, individual to the researcher, individual to the organization, and, uh, and also to the community. Um, over the summer, we did a survey uh, out to us, because Etsy has about 150 researcher university members. About 15% of our members are innovative research universities. So we, we surveyed them and we also surveyed our partners. We, we went out via Stand ICT and, and HS Booster as well, basically saying, OK, this is what we understand today. Please tell us what we can do better. Um, and the results of those surveys, the, the, the survey ran over the summer. We had a, a quite a lot of responses, like 20 responses um, from different categories of researchers. So from postdoc, uh, um, early grads, um, research leads, so the, all the way through, and even project leads as well. So it's very interesting. And um, we broke it down into three main areas of finding. One was communication and knowledge. So lack of knowledge, lack of information, lack of knowing where to go. And we're trying to treat ways of doing that, outreach, communication, education, a clear website, uh, leaflets, all of that, you know, all of those simple things, but they're not really that simple. Um, value, so this has been mentioned by Livy already. Why would a researcher want to spend resources and time getting involved in the standards meeting where he may get pushed away by all the big companies who have got their own agendas? Well, we can help them understand the value and help them not to be pushed away by all those big companies who have their own agendas, actually work in partnership, because that many of those projects are made up of universities, researchers, and big companies, operators, vendors. So how to help them get their values. Also the recognition. We don't yet have an award, but we probably would like to have one, but we want to do it properly and make sure we do it in a sort of Etsy specific way. Um, but also um, having referable biblios in the, uh, in the documents is very important. I mean, all of the Etsy documents are available for free and you can get them easily but a researcher being able to say look at that my, my work is on that page there and that could be a KPI or a KVI for the researcher so what we're trying to do following the survey is on identify the the KPIs that a researcher would have and the last one was funding so this is where Stand ICT and HS Booster come in um, information about where to go so that would be the radars and the EUOS and those sort of things and then funding can you help me get to a standards meeting can the standards organization do more online meetings so I can get involved or can they lower the entry point of membership to help sure that university is involved so it's all about accessibility as well so there's lots of really important threads independent but at the end of the day they all come together and the the important thing that we're trying to do with Sense Analytics, with others as well, is accelerate and increase the percentage of research input that makes it through standardization, only through, and then makes it into products on the market, because that's the important thing. You want to find that knowledge enabling a service, a product, and a market in a country, in a region, Europe, but also internationally as well. And this is where standards come into it. Uh, standards based giving you international reach and interoperability, interoperability, which is part of the value statement. Thanks, David. I think yeah, the value, the value of um, the value to a project's result, and the, the potential for result to, in the future, make make the market or, or make impact, greater impact than than it, it could without this, uh, is 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 really important. And um, I've got a, a practical question there, which uh, I hadn't, we hadn't really discussed in our in our pre uh, pre meeting, but I think it's an important one. So from a this is to everyone if you want to comment then great so from a practical point of view so i'm a researcher and i'm interested in standards now but what type of things do i need to be able to learn or what are the practicalities of how to get involved in it in a standards group and how difficult it is is it what do i need to learn from a not a technological side but a practical uh, practical side uh, from a and that's open to yeah. all of you. Hi, Nick. Uh, Ray here. So just to, from a researcher's perspective, I mean, th this is a very good question because people often say, well, I don't know where to go, where, where to start. And as, as, as David said, like, you know, as, Sense like and, and Etsy like have their own mechanisms like you know for trying to engage and bring people involved and I'm quite open about that inviting experts into the process of standards standards development, uh, but from a researcher's pers perspective sometimes they don't even know 
what, about what their national standards body is called and, and, and the fact that they can register as an expert with their national standards body and get engaged uh, at a European level then representing their country, you know, which is which is which is a big it's a big deal. Like, I mean, you're, you're actually you're representing your country at a, a European um, a committee level. You're contributing to European standards, harmonized standards and and also uh, you know, via the, that European platform to get involved in international standards development, like with you know, W3C or ISO or IEC, ITUT, these various other organizations as well. So. The, the first port of call would be like I mean, just a simple question: of How can I get get engaged? And and a bit, apart from talking to all of us, because we're 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 evangelists for for standardization anyway. We're actively trying to get people to get involved all the time. So ask us, ask you know, ask David, like you know, ask ask uh, Livia, ask anyone from Stanley City or HS Booster, like what can we do? Because that's what we're trying to do is is to to facilitate that. And then lastly, like, you know, um, uh, it, maybe we can be us even as well. You can talk to your national standards body and your, your European organizations. All of these people are open, open doors or uh, with open arms will welcome you into the fold. Thanks, Ray. I don't know if anyone else has a very quick comment on, on that. David, Olivia, are you here? Very quick, um, just uh, as Ray said, just ask. Etsy has research at etsy.org. I'm sure Sensenic has an email address, which is very simple. Just ask. Most importantly, ask somebody who's already done it. So testimonials, proof of concepts. If you know a researcher who's done it, uh, ask them. Somebody in the same university, somebody in a partner university. Reach out to your communication, uh, your community and say, I've got a question. Because the knowledge is there, but it's completely lost and hidden. And our challenge is to raise it up and make it visible. So literally just ask and the answer will is there. May I just add a word? Um, that Standards, it's an enormous field. And I think for every, looking just at Etsy, everyone in it is an individual. It's it, it's not um, it's not some uh, standard place, <laughs> literally a standard mm. place where everybody mm. is the same. Everyone is different, and I think for nearly, I think for most people there, it starts with a passionate interest in one particular aspect of of uh, technical development, which leads them to want to be involved in the standards. People care, really care about what they're doing, and it takes them over, you know over and beyond um, the limits of, of, of working to, to get something to happen. It's, it's a big thing, but be an individual, go with what you want to do and you will be welcome. As Dave says, you will be welcome. To pick up on what Suno was saying, like standards is only as good as the as the committee that develops them. So we need that diversity. Exactly. We need engagement. We need geographic dis, uh, dis, uh, distribution of standards experts. We need gender balance. We need age, yeah, young people and old people like involved. And so we need to get need to get that message right. Running out of time, Nick. So I'll pass back to you. <laughs> they are the, the alarm on my phone's just gone off as well. So, right, you've got thirty seconds each panelist. That's excellent. Thank you for that input. It's passion and caring and knowing and wanting to contribute. So, very very quickly, you've got thirty seconds each before we get kicked off. Ray, okay. thirty seconds to close. What needs to be done? What more needs to be done? But I think we need more engagement and standardization, you know, from from particularly from from academia. And I think that more needs to be done in that area. So in 30 seconds, I would say that we need greater recognition of, of the activities involved in standardization. Like so people who are engaged in in standards development, in building the ecosystem, in, in developing landscape reports, uh, editing documents, etc. That needs to be recommend, recognized as a metric, you know, which which facilitates career progression, because we want people to to progress their careers, whether they work in industry or in research centers and academia. And this needs to be recognized, I think, as a metric for 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 um, uh, from an academic point of view for for uh, career progression, not just PhD students, you know, funding uh, um, publications. Brilliant, thank you. Uh, very quickly, uh, Yuriko. Yeah, I think I'll add, I'll add a bit to what was just said. I think uh, the importance of being willing to work, but. We also need, and I'm going to be very bad on this, we also need financial support. Uh, I'll give you an example in manufacturing, uh, Europe, all European stakeholders compete with countries that have government funding to attend these meetings, to participate in these activities, which makes it a bit more difficult. If we also want an European uh, voice a bit more louder in some of these technical committees, we also need to support them financially to attend them and to support development of standards. 
Brilliant. Thank you very much. Uh, Livia? I have in mind two, two things fully aligned with what Ray said. First thing is to attract the future generation of standard makers and the Horizon Europe CSA, which is currently open for submission, will definitely help with that. And second is to make the contribution to standards matter for the career progression of a researcher as it is for academic publication to give the incentive part that is currently a bit missing. Thank you very much, Livia. And finally, David. Mm, I agree with everything that the previous speaker said. <laughs> but um, <laughs> recognize the value of standardization. Recognize that, honestly, standardization involves a lot of nice people and most of them really just want to help so we want we want to get this message across to the researchers if you've got a question ask and you will get an answer from somebody hs booster and stand ict are very good examples of resources where this can be done but ask etsy ask sense and like and we will give you an answer that's why we're there and also with the stat with the bodies we should work together so if some standards body has a great idea we can share those and, and go forward in a coordinated manner so yes um, just just keep on moving forward thank you very much i'd like to thank all of the four of my uh, panelists that was an excellent uh, excellent uh, introduction to today's event and the future is four p's participation of people who are interested in standards and want to make a difference they need to be passionate, that's the second P, passionate about the technology, passionate about making a difference, and they need to have progression as well. So career progression and having their activities and uh, inputs uh, reflected in the work they do. And of course, I know, I know this is a European, but they need uh, they need money. So pounds, let's talk about pounds here. Uh, they need they need their funding and, 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 and backing for this type of activity too. So. Thank you very much, everyone. And I'll hand back to Silvana. Wonderful. Thank you, Nick. Thank you, panelists. Um, just to the tail end of your discussions, I put something in the chat um, as well before we race into our mammoth session three. So uh, whilst I, I just pick this up, could I ask the panelists in session three to uh, put on your videos, please? And could I ask also for the uh, backup slide? which presents uh, all eight. Thank you very much, uh, Maria. So just to conclude though, Nick, on the research projects, and, and I think what you were saying as well, David, in terms of sort of asking, um, from our experience, we've seen those research projects that uh, are working on a specific technology, and I give it an example of ontologies and semantic interoperability, there, there is an expert board and some people are like them, some people hate them. But if there's an expert board of individuals who are already perhaps chairs or moderating a technical committee or working group within an SDO, that ensures that whatever goes on in the project, there's a continued dialogue and perhaps can uh, where, where there are demos happening as well because we know that those use cases and best practices are extremely important to match what's going on with an existing standard and if they're part of um the the project itself it, it can also make it can also help the the dialogue between the between research and and the sdos so we 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 have a case in that and i think that's extremely important i don't know david if you wanted to say anything to uh, on that if not we can move into session three no that's fine go ahead oh, fully free. lovely thank you david so uh into session three we're, we're good at timing as well uh this is an interactive discussion on how technologies are impacted by standardization and we wanted to offer uh this next part of the of the webinar a voice to the experts so we've talked about how san ict started its pilot project five years ago with the ec saying well let's try and um provide funding looking at your point out Risa, before that funding is absolutely crucial and so we wanted to have an opportunity to have that uh here um and specifically each speaker has is going to address two questions the first is how do standards make a difference in the context of the EU Green Deal and the new industrial strategy for Europe within your specific sector, because you'll see uh, each of the individuals from the agenda have a specific technology that they work on specifically, and they're usually, and, and, and all of them have either been or are fellows or active members in the technical working groups that Ray mentioned earlier on, which is fantastic. So this session is really, 
putting the words uh, on paper and what's actually happened. Second question I'll answer is what challenges remain and what recommendations you would give for your specific tech sector to the high level forum. And so we're gonna try and give a stab at this. Uh, and without further ado, I'm going to pass the floor uh, immediately to our speaker one, Jaren, uh, team lead digital factories at TNO. Over to you, Jaren, and you, I won't present each speaker for you to time, but you right. have all uh, speaker details on the agenda, as you can see. Thank you very much, over to you. All right, thank you, Savannah. Thanks a lot for the introduction. Um, I'm team lead at Tino, which is Dutch Research Institute. So you could consider me a researcher. Actually, Silvana convinced me to apply for the funding. And then my company actually decided, uh, if you're gonna apply for funding yourself, maybe we should fund you uh, from a company perspective. So it actually opened up a wider range of possibilities for me to contribute to standards. Um, I wanted to give a smart small um, context to digital twins. I'll keep time short. Um, for me, we, my assumption is we all in the EU want to make better decisions. And I think that's a very basic thing, you know, concerning improvement, prosperity, et cetera. This is what we want to do. And we have certain goals uh, to, to take these uh, decisions for, and that's to become more sustainable, become more resilient, or become more competitive. And probably we can list three, four other items there as well. And to make decisions, we need information. Uh, we base those on ex our experience and our knowledge and our you know, understanding of the world. And I think that's where digital twins come into play. And so we have this experience and knowledge. That's what the twin is. Can we automate that part of the world in a scalable way that's verified and that can actually predict the outcomes that we're desiring, that we're expecting to happen. So I think that's the big challenge of making digital twins real. Uh, and that's really hard. It's really, really hard uh, because information and data, there's a lot of standards already there, but experience and knowledge, that's very hard to standardize. Um, so I think if we have those digital twins, we want to make them scale. So if we can skip to the next sheet. So I think creating a sustainability, resilience, and competitiveness on a European scale, it requires everyone to be able to make better decisions and not just any individual or single company. And that means we want to democratize experience and knowledge and make these digital twins shareable and transferable between companies or individuals. I think these are very, very challenging tasks. Um, so there's a lot to be done before we actually you know, make that work. And uh, I've contributed with Ray uh, also on, on the EOS landscape of digital twin standards where we listed 200, over 250 standards that are involved in making this work. And it's because each domain is currently doing this by themselves on their own uh, in an um, isolated standards landscape. Uh, whereas uh, I'm active in, in a kind of wider view. Um, uh, for example, I'm both into biodiversity digital twins, ocean digital twins, uh, industry digital twins, wind uh, mill digital twins. So th there's all kinds of different you know, aspects that are doing digital twins, but they're all doing it separately. And they're all have a hard time figuring out what twins really are. And it's hard to capture because it has many strong ties to other fields like AI, analytics, data spaces, domain experts, and they all need to intermingle and talk about what this concept really is. And similar to AI, they require good quality data and, and, and something you can trust. Uh, it needs to be verifiable. Uh, so it's very, they share uh, challenges together. And it means that these twins need to become interoperable with AI systems or with data suppliers or with domain expert models. And so all of this needs to be standardized in the future to truly become democratized. So we need to talk about what are the actual concepts we're talking about, the structure and parts, uh, what kind of patterns do we apply in practice? 
and, and how do we make them interoperable? Which types of twins and, and which kind of methodologies do we need to make them really work? How do we talk about life cycles? And then at the end, hopefully we can get to, you know, how do we execute, share and transfer these across domains and boundaries? So can we actually talk about not just data spaces, but maybe twin spaces where we can federate the, the expertise we have? So in terms of recommendations, um, I'm currently seeing a lot of projects in the EU doing something with twins, uh, but they're only starting to share knowledge. And there isn't uh, like a CSA trying to capture um, these types of methodology patterns, structures across these projects. And I think that's really what's needed here. So we can actually go from these uh, examples of how they could work to a, like a structured way of, of developing twins and, and create this transition path. And that we actually define what common good twins could be versus intellectual property twins. Um, so I think that's very briefly what I was going to say in these five minutes. And uh, Silvana, I'm going to hand it back to you. That's brilliant, Joan. So as you can see, that's uh, super. And uh, it's nice that we, we've got this structured approach that clearly aims to uh, put content into the report. And we're sure if, uh, well, we, what we'd like to see is if you have additions to any comments and insights the speakers are sharing, please add them in the chat too. Next up, Fiona Delaney, um, over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Silvana. Um, uh, I've chosen this background slide because this is a standardization publication that has recently uh, been made public. It's from ISO, it's uh, TR3242, and it's a selection of global use cases um, for blockchain and distributed ledger technologies. Each of these 22 use cases were submitted by real world businesses or research and uh, certainly the European Commission submissions are more from a policy type perspective or a deployment um, a testing concept. So there's uh, so a lot of information in there, which uh, my colleague Caroline uh, Thomas, who's from the UK, from BSI, the, the, the British Standards Authority there, um, created a template with our community of experts, which includes about 100 plus standardization experts active in TC307. Uh, and I'd like to uh, just acknowledge uh, the hard work that happened over the course of about 18 months or two years there with um, very active um, standardization experts uh, from all over the world to uh, contribute to this method that looks into blockchain use cases, not only as technical implementations, but as instances of tech enabled business models in the global digital marketplace. And that's a key point for where I want to go. And uh, just the few points that I'd like to make in this presentation here. Um, uh, Savannah, I don't have any more slides, so you—I mean, you can you can leave that up or or whatever. Uh, I don't know what people are more comfortable with—a talking head or <laughs> the pictures in the background. So uh, I'm the CEO of an agri tech company called Origin Chain Networks, and we leverage or we use a lot of R and D in the blockchain and convergence technology space to explore the context of agriculture and on farm transformation to the benefit of food producers. Uh, as my colleague Jeroen mentioned earlier, there's this concept of digital twins for good or blockchain and the context of common good or the socioeconomic context that we now find ourselves in. Um, and I think in the broadest sense, not just for the European Green Deal or the new industrial strategy, uh, the European Union, the European Commission finds itself in this leadership position because of our consensus um, requirements essentially from political governance and national government participation that we have an excellent way of exploring the impact of multinational deployment of technology across various different boundaries. So these are very, very interesting contexts. And we can see that both for Europe and across the globe, the benefit of standardized approaches and consideration of these all of these kinds of technology solutions um, 
uh, highlight the socioeconomic turning point I think that we have in the century that we're in. The importance of standards to life on earth when we think about the climate action or the Green Deal, as well as from business perspective and industry points of view. So some of the headline topics include technology convergence. We've already talked about AI or IoT, digital twins, Web3, uh, data governance, the concept of privacy, data spaces, GDPR, right to be forgotten, self-sovereign identity. What do these things mean for Europe in the global context? Uh, demographic pressures, resource shortages across the globe and into this, into um, even into space, uh, smart energy, renewables, near earth and space exploration. What is the impact of these things and how do we create access to these new types of technologies to the benefits of, of life on earth? Um, and, and that, of course, impacts on climate imperative looking at the bioeconomy, net zero, plastic pollution, global warming, rising oceans. How do we standardize methods and measurements that can capture information that we can understand and that industry can integrate with and interact with? So on farms, we see a lot of pressure uh, on farmers to perform in this climate facing way that that doesn't necessarily originate from the context of industry. And how do we disintermediate that? And how do we co-create kinds of standards that can address these issues? Um, standards, of course, help us frame and describe and measure a given domain. Um, it facilitates mutual understanding and provides tools to best guide those practices and implementable solutions. Um, and some important developments in emerging technology standards as they relate to the world around us in the way that I've framed it here. Um, I'm just gonna pick a couple of examples and these are all from some of the work that I'm involved with, with at ISO. So enhanced land cover classification, and that's in TC211, which is the geographic information system from the information communities working group. Um, Classificate land classification for mapping and for um, near earth observ observation models and, and computer vision assistant models uh, is super important and impacts on the value chain of the produce and the land that is being classified. And then we look at number two, uh, revised standard representation of geographic point location and commercial aspects. So we're looking at data product specifications and observations. Um, I'm just looking at my time and I'm totally running out of time. So, Sylvana, yeah. sorry about that. <laughs> That's, Let me... if, if, you, if you can do your last minute, that would be great. Fiona, okay. Thank you so much. So observations, measurements, and then data quality. And these are all the things that were um, referenced in the previous talk. Emerging standards in DLT, blockchain use cases, I've already mentioned that. And importantly, and I think very much for the context of the conversation we're having today, innovation management. What does that mean and what is the impact of it? Innovation is not something that happens in a lab. It's not an idea and it's not an invention. It happens in the marketplace. And so innovation integrated into standards development from the market side, from SMEs, from startups, from big businesses, must have a voice and a place in this consideration of standardization and education. So thank you very much. Wonderful, Fiona. Thank you so much uh, for keeping to time as well. And there's lots going on in the chat. Just to uh, reassure everybody, we are collecting the information in there, so don't worry. Uh, Muslim, I'm going to go over to you immediately. Off you go. Thank you. Thank you very much, Zivana. If they can pull up my slide again there, great, thanks. So very happy to be here. Uh, I'm uh, happy, uh, let's say, Standard City Fellow. Uh, I'm a Principal Architect at uh, Vodafone. I'm also Chairman of Etsy. Automated Future Internet and Vice Chairman of HCTC Int, also Vice Chairman of um, Federated Sbets Working Group in uh, ITUT, and also working in many other SDOs as well. And that's why I'm going to give you some perspective today about this. So, coming to the first question about how standards make a difference in EU strategic objectives, meaning the Green Deal and the industry strategy. So, first of all, uh, me as an insider working in, let's say, different trends, whether it is AI or ML whether it is, let's say, uh, 5G, including all the, the driving forces like uh, automation, autonomics, process automation also for industrial uh, verticals. So when you touch upon different streams, you can see that each one of these is pretty diverse, pretty scattered, uh, also fast paced, uh, very changing very fast. So when you work with those things and they come in interactions together, you know, so it gets even more complex, meaning that 
if I cannot keep pace with how 5G is evolving to 5G and beyond 6G, and also AI, when I want to apply it to a 5G, let's say a use case, AI itself is quickly evolving. So there are many, let's say, dynamics here. And uh, my, let's say, learning is that uh, also from practice, what I've also done and then proven myself, is that uh, standards are the best way to really, let's say, frame all this, let's say, swarm of dynamics uh, in a concrete, let's say, direction. Meaning that if I, for example, am working with, a, let's say, a complex 5G use case for an industry vertical, which is, for example, automotive or retail, and I use AI uh, techniques that, that, let's say, are steering those processes. Uh, then uh, if I look at standards, there are excellent, let's say, structures inside standards uh, groups, uh, SDOs, whether it's Etsy, ITU, or whether it's uh, IEEE, there are groups that are specialized in specific aspects that help you to really, let's say, uh, uh, frame, build on what's there, first of all, and secondly, uh, put the frame around that trend that you are using in order to get the best out of it. And then also knowing what you exactly need uh, is also, let's say, a guide, which is the way you should look into. Because for example, if you only know Etsy, uh, they have a specific approach to, let's say, tackling things. If you take, for example, TM Forum, which is a SDO-like forum, where I've also done, let's say, two catalysts on data spaces and data sharing. So they have a different approach where they build everything as a library and they have, let's say, this uh, open digital architecture paradigm. So knowing what exactly your use case, your business case is requiring will guide you uh, towards the approach you need to follow. And then the approach that you will follow to get what you need uh, will also include a hint, which is the way you should look in. And then you can combine different setups or, or, or let's say uh, assets from different SDOs to put them together. So standards as a collective of SDOs uh, is a, let's say a framing entity, which allows you to really get clear direction and achieve your, let's say, depth that you want to, to have there. Without those, I can't imagine how things would work out at all. Even when it is, uh, let's say, cutting edge technology, early stage, not yet adopted widely in the industry, but still in the in the formation phase or bootstrapping phase, still standards there, they are a key. Otherwise, uh, I don't see how this is going to come to the place. And then another thing is that what I've seen is that uh, working with the different SDOs uh, in standard ST projects and also in, in SDOs themselves directly in, 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 uh, with the deliverables and, and with the working groups, I've seen that uh, the ecosystem perspective is getting more important, meaning that it's not about, let's say, if I primarily work for a large operator or a CSP, communication service provider, that I have that perspective because ecosystems, they're evolving. We have a lot of today things like disaggregation, uh, open RAN, open ecosystem, we have this inclusion principle, which I follow, meaning that you should open the ecosystem for smaller players, SMEs, one of the EU objectives to include SMEs more and more. So you have a more diversified uh, not only from a human, but also from ecosystem perspective kind of dynamics, which is there. And to really, uh, let's say, uh, let those things thrive and, and come to shape, you need to, let's say, model the interactions between stakeholders. So the, how they come together in the ecosystem, how they share the load, the revenue, what are the interfaces, and also the interface between technologies themselves, like in the upper point, whether it's, let's say, some AI software uh, supplier uh, interacting with a 5G provider. So interactions in the ecosystem between stakeholders and between technologies, Standards are also the best way to really, let's say, model those, uh, set the standard or set the, let's say, pave the way for how those things should come together, and then they will work uh, together because this is how it really works. And then back to the, let's say, second question that, uh, that Silvana posed. So the main challenges that I see uh, in, in this respect is, first of all, that uh, knowing SDOs from the inside, uh, luckily many of them, in my case, I can see that the let's say interfaces are very suboptimal and it's very hard to collaborate among them uh, unless you have let's say individuals who really know uh, both or all involved as the from the inside. Uh, if you are external to the others and only coming out from one, uh, it's really hard because the interface are not optimal. It's hard to collaborate. It's hard even to see what are really the, 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 the in which line they are going. And that's why this really let's say takes on the synergy and the potential that you can actually extract there. And to really improve, overcome this aspect, it's a real challenge. And uh, there are different ways. There are liaisons, there are collaboration efforts. Uh, but those things, what I've seen, they don't have a long span. They, they start nicely and then they phase out before really real fruit comes to the table. So that's one challenge I see that uh, could be worked on. And then another thing is that bringing together industry players uh, from, let's say, different types uh, of, of, let's say, stakeholder to collaborate on certain uh, entities. For example, if I want to write a standard for example, on how I, let's say, invoke in a digital twin scenario, like I had in one of the Catalyst projects, 
uh, for specific purposes of let's say steering a public stakeholder uh, with algorithms on let's say data capturing and uh, doing let's say uh, smart city services. So for that kind of perspective, I need several let's say uh, stakeholders with, with, with the public stakeholder, the operator or or the SME or the software vendor providing the, the algorithms. I need several stakeholders to come together to build the standard. The standard cannot be uh, dictated by one player or it cannot be uh, let's say if, if it's going to be optimal or work out fine uh, or widely applicable uh, it should involve several things so how to bring players to the table to collaborate to have let's say involved players like a csp an operator and, and, and sme and the public stakeholder together to work on the standard because they are all stakeholders in that standard they all use it uh, in that ecosystem nobody is let's say owning it or using it exclusively this also needs to thrive and, and uh, a bit because i've seen it, let's say coming really short in that. And then from my side, what I would really recommend is, first of all, to identify strategic unique selling points of each SDO for a specific area. For example, if I want to look at, let's say, one of the areas that I work with is data spaces, data sharing, and leveraging data-driven services. So if I do this work in, for example, TM Forum, their strength is in modularizing and packaging those aspects and besides an architecture into, let's say, a library of, of, of let's say, components that can be reused. If I look at it from uh, Etsy perspective, like I'm doing now, it is more about how can you really test and establish this kind of scenario uh, in, in a robust and reusable form. So you should really look at what can each, uh, let's say, SDO provide in terms of strength and leverage on that, even covering the same area, then those things will come together and you will have really a great result. Because yeah. one SDO is stronger on one thing uh, and the other is, is, uh, is a stronger on another thing. And this really, to really identify this and really target this in that way, that put them together is a, is a recommendation. And the other one is to, to wrap up also, is to incentivize and encourage joint activities, even if it's smaller projects, like for example, Stand ICT, uh, really is a, it's a very good melting pot or, or a platform where people can interact of any stakeholder type and really have a mock-up scenario uh, where you can, let's say, mock up your, uh, or, or, or uh, say simulate an ecosystem and really exactly target what you want to achieve. So even if it is, let's say, on a medium plus mature scale, it's still a very good starting point to really, let's say, set foot or, or set, set the, the, the stream in that direction. So with that, I'd like to say a big thanks. Great to be here. And uh, those thank you. Those Thank those. you very much, Muslim. Very good uh, insights. In fact, I wanted to highlight for all, uh, and let's have the next slide up, please, uh, Maria, for all the panelists here, uh, what we should do is trying to pull out some success stories that we have on a dedicated page on the Stan ICT, where we give examples exactly of where you're talking about the industry cases. The same applies also that Fiona's given some wonderful examples before. And I think we should try and articulate them better uh, on a sec the success page for, for Stan ICTs. This is certainly something we need to do. I'm going to pass the floor now to Jens. Uh, over to you, uh, which is the example of us being agile in Stan ICT for the digital product passport. Uh, this is the example we have here. Jens, the floor is yours. Thank you. Five. Thank you very much, Silvana, and thanks for being here. Uh, yeah, so, um, so I'm Jens Geico from the Standardization Council Industry 4.0. And as already announced by Silvana, besides others, I'm a member of the EU project SILPAS, which deals on digital product passports. And also I'm convener of the Stand ICT group on uh, digital product passports. And we have to finalize the report so it can be published hopefully soon. And also besides others, I'm chair of the Zen, Zenlec and Etsy coordination group on smart manufacturing. And I'm very happy that here we could establish this coordination group with all three ESOs. Uh, so the, the task was to have one slide and then to explain it within five minutes. And I thought, how can I start? And I started uh, with, uh, um, uh, with the Jubilee we have to, to celebrate uh, because uh, at, at 1st of January, 30 years ago, uh, the EU internal market started. Uh, it's a celebration. Most people, they didn't recognize it. I, I just, by, by chance, I read it in a news uh, article about that. And if we think back 30 years ago, this was a very visionary step uh, at that time under the, the presidency of Jacques Delors. And it, it was really successful. Uh, and, and unfortunately, it's not very widely recognized and appreciated outside of a small community of experts. But without that, I think European countries would not really play a big role in, in the world economy uh, because all European countries are small. 
uh, including Germany. So sometimes some Germans think we are a big country, but Germany accounts for 1% of the world population. Uh, but together in Europe, uh, we play, uh, Europe plays a role and, and that's quite important. Um, and, and now we've, we are facing several challenges and one is the green and the digital transition. And I think this is a really a unique chance to bring this internal market into through the digital area. Uh, so coming from the manufacturing area, uh, there is a concept called Industry 4.0, and uh, this has been uh, developed in the recent years. Uh, uh, it, it started with the, uh, the core of automation, but it's, it's far going beyond that. It's not just automation of the shop floor, it's, it's going to the whole uh, value chain. And uh, several international standards have been developed uh, at, at IAC, for example, and then they are transformed to European standards at Senelec. And uh, if we look at these uh, concepts developed at uh, Industry 4.0 and the EU Green and Digital Transition, we can combine both and um, uh, bring it to the digital era. And, and we can say even this is a kind of EU internal market 2.0. Uh, so we use this uh, principle of the internal market to say if we have one regulation, we have one standard and one market of, I don't know how many, 400 of even 500 uh, a million people if we look at the EFTA countries and so on. And here the principles of, of European standardization, they are established for many years and they are um, very successful um, because uh, very often we talk about SME integration. And, and of course, we know that also we, we need to improve the, the, to include SMEs into standardization. Uh, but if you look at other systems, I think we are in Europe, we are quite successful. So for European standardizations, uh, there is a kind of level playing field uh, for small and medium sized enterprises um, and, and even for, for smaller uh, enterprises. And, and in Europe, we don't have any hyperscalers. They are all in the US or in, in the Far East, but we don't have hyperscalers in Europe. But if we combine our forces, then we can set uh, standards not only for Europe, but for the world from Europe. And this uh, helps to uh, uh, achieve European sovereignty and to avoid lock-in effects uh, and strategic dependencies on these uh, non-European hyperscalers. And uh, so here we really have uh, a chance and standards play an, um, an essential role in this. We are the new legislative framework. And there was the question, what is our wish to this uh, high level uh, form on European standardization? So uh, I, I wish really this uh, forum that they, they don't go, uh, get lost into the, the details uh, of some standardization procedures or how long is the commenting period for this draft and so on, but that they, they really look on, on a visionary uh, foresight as, as Jacques Delors and the others did 30 years ago, and they really bring the EU internal market to, into the uh, digital age, and, and we need to develop a common vision, uh, as described above, uh, how to make uh, uh, this internal market the basis for a European data economy, and this includes also uh, digital machine-readable standards, uh, and um, it's not just digitization, it's, it's a topic where you can say, yeah, we can write new standards and we write them in the old way uh, on, on paper or electronic paper called PDF, but we also have to develop uh, digital standards. And therefore it will be a, a game changer how uh, standards will be developed and how they will be used. And of course, finally, this uh, will be a huge job uh, for, for awareness raising, uh, for, uh, training and uh, for dissemination for, for all actors uh, along this. And, and if we could establish this and bring it uh, to reality, I think this is a really a unique uh, chance for Europe and uh, let's go for it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jens. Uh, very nice uh, to consider the, the internal market to something that um, yeah many perhaps don't remember. Uh, and thank you for sticking for keeping to time. Um, in fact, when the DPP report is out, we will then circulate it to to everyone to uh, to read. Um, up next, we have uh, Nikita Lukianets. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Nikita. Hi everyone. It's a pleasure to be here, Silvana, and uh, the rest of the of the panel today. I want to uh, I want to say big uh, big thanks for the opportunity to listen to what is being discussed and my uh, 
my command, it may be late, but still for, for the previous panel, uh, which, uh, which David has largely expanded on, I wanted to mention even before I start, I do think that um, the course of this discussion and the theme of this discussion is too much focused on the standards while the standards span from community. And it's really the community that leads to the born of a successful standard, not just a one individual or one company or one legislator group that tends to uh, and wants to, to to bring it top down. And um, for for this reason, I think uh, Stand ICT as, as such is a very powerful platform because it allows for community to get started and to 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 bring such an ex, uh, such an exchange such an exchange so my background is uh, physics and and human computer interaction and i'm currently um, play a role as a chief technology officer in the health tech startup and i'm also a founder of a nonprofit organization called open ethics initiative which is aimed to bring uh, standards to transparency to uh, autonomous systems uh, and the reason i'm here is because I want to speak on how standards could impact AI, not only from a safety and ethics perspective, but more on the European scale. And, and to answer this question of how exactly does it fit the European strategy and EU Green Deal? And um, I've written a couple of notes on this before before the conversation, but um, to, to make a point here, I want to introduce the concept of waste and the concept of deadweight loss in economy that is called caused when the standards are not there and when the standards are not there and when everyone is doing the repetitive work we tend to uh, create a siloed uh, outcomes and 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 there is no collaboration and such so standards could play this an important gluing role where companies tend to shift from a uh, very much competing to collaborating and then choosing their uh, best and the most valuable most valuable um, services and therefore bringing them to the market. And uh, if, if you look at the amount of investment for the next two years, it's around 5 billion, which is almost nothing compared to VC investment in the US or even globally, which, which means that uh, companies who are already established or, or trying to grow can only um, bring um, competitive advantage and establish competitive advantage if they stick to one or or another ecosystem, or build one, which is which is extremely which is extremely tough uh, and and hard to do. So creating creating standards in a way is is uh, will enable this multi-country projects in, inside the European Union and beyond because we we could embark other countries to follow the standards that, that the European Union community uh, will will bring. And uh, of course, as um, a community with limited resource uh, use, uh, usually, we can move the uh, our accomplishments in single SMEs to a better interoperability so that one business can work with another business can work in with another business and this is what we have been functioning uh, we have been focusing on um, open ethics initiatives specifically we wanted to establish this uh, way on how companies and digital products could, could communicate in a transparent manner uh, the ways the ways they're built and the outcomes they're they're about to uh, to bring um, and uh, of course um, transparency may lead to uh, may lead to safety as a result so my recommendation here um, would be to make sure that the community is put at the first place that there is um, a way to nurture this community uh, where every member of it will be uh, motivated not only by 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 the global uh, or or solely european interest but also by uh, by the fact that 
if they're a member of the company that is about to establish standard or highly contribute to a standard, this creates a huge um, opportunities for the company because with these standards, they can offer uh, interoperability to their own services. Um, so I, I would say that there is also um, a gap uh, with many, many um, terminology basis which which exists not only in on um in standardization field but 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 even in a data field in the ai field in general so uh, for someone who has been working on standards for for five years already and i feel i'm really novice here because i know people who have been working here for 25 years and 30 years uh that having this pathway for people who start to work on standard to motivate them, we need to lower the barrier to, to work on the standard. And we need to create them places to get started so that they will discover uh, areas for, for, for their interest and they would, would know what are the elements where they could jump jump on and contribute. Mm -hmm. And Nikita, uh, uh, I, I need your concluding yeah. statement when you can. Thank you. Uh, I'm I'm concluding right right here, uh, focusing on people aspect of uh, of the problem in in standardization space in AI space uh, as well. Thank you for your attention, and I'm again again very fond of listening. Thanks, Akita. Sorry, I didn't know you were just oh, I'm ready to close there. That's extremely good. Thank you. Uh, next up, Lewis. Um, where is Hello, Luis Mananabal, mm -hmm. okay. also Hello. an existing fellow, which is super. Over to you, Luis. Hello, every, hello everybody. Uh, first one is thanks to Stan ICT and their team for inviting me uh, to this expert panel. So let me inter introduce uh, myself. I am Luis Moran, an experienced ICT senior advisor, specialized in ICT and governance uh, management. So I recognize that I am a different, I have a different profile uh, for this uh, high technological forum. I am focused more on management and governance of, of ma and management of IT organization, IT departments, and the services that technology, technology are producing. So I put a a, t a title of my contribution does is ICT people matter. Uh, <clears throat> that uh, this means that uh, ICT people should be more important in the standards world. New technology must be linked to appropriate management models. So for, uh, for having success, uh, ICT technological standards, that is very important, uh, Need, uh, to, need have together uh, ICT management standard. This is important uh, to me, is, the, is the, my main message to this uh, uh, standardization forum. In this context, when I mention people, that people matters, uh, uh, I mean uh, with people adequate work models for ICT people, uh, efficient processes, new having a new executive mindset new people a new company culture and mindset delivery new uh, technology te uh, technology solution via services uh, passion having passion or, uh, in the professional uh, and so on whatever you want all of this is the context of management uh, as you can see in the slide i don't know where you have the slide <laughs> yeah as you can see in the slide um, uh, we have the in the cross area we have the main uh, uh, horizontal or cross transformation uh, initiative in the Un uh, European Union in ICT that is digital and green and of course we cannot below other different that uh, could appear uh, like uh, productivity uh, companies productivity and so on and in vertical uh, in vertical we have sector or specific uh, sector in initiative like new industry uh, fine tech legal transport energy retail agricultural whatever sector you wanted to put them in the middle of them i put some some thought and some opinions 
excuse me. So let's start with the <clears throat> with Europe digital transformation and how ICT management, I insist, management standard could impact in the in this uh, digital transformation. In this way, for adequate digitalization in Europe, we need to act in two principal axes. First one is manage the transformation, that is the movement or the change, manage the change, and manage the results of the digitalized world. So in this in this way, we need mainly standards to manage continuous digitalization, the movement, helping organization to transform towards a more digitalized structure. But according we are generating this, uh, this new digital world, we need to define a standard in order to manage this, this new world, uh, digitalized. We need uh, new work models and, and how to manage uh, new dig this digital services that we are creating. So let's go to the other quadrant that is or other cross initiative that is uh, European Green Deal. Uh, in the Green Deal, I think that uh, my thought, uh, my analysis is that we have this uh, similar uh, necessities. Uh, in in Songwine, we want to we need to manage the change to a greener world, and we have to manage a, the green, and sustain the greener scenario that we are, will create. So I think that we have uh, related to standards. I, I have to uh, we have to create a standard. It, uh, for the setup of new green mindset for executives. This is very important for executives, for companies uh, having changing the culture. A standard to include uh, green in ICT areas, so, uh, starting with a strategy, with the ICT architecture, with operation, uh, uh, in order to manage this new uh, green transformation wave, wave that we have to uh, impulse. Uh, related to change, to challenge, but excuse me. In uh, my opinion, uh, uh, related to the main challenge, uh, starting with how support the European plans to impulse contribution to the evolution uh, movements. Uh, for this evolution, I think that the standards uh, world has forgotten the management. Management is, is not the main player in this stand, uh, standard world's movement in, uh, to support the change and transformation. One of our main challenges is the absence of useful standards to conduct the change. In that way, we don't have standards to manage digital and green transformation, as I mentioned before. Uh, but top management need clear standards and reference to conduct, to conduct his continuous change in their organization. Following this analysis, my recommendation for a better uh, future are mainly two. First, uh, ICT, ICT people and work model must matter, have to be considered for future standards, and ICT management standards must be uh, developed following the evolution of technological technological standardization. Lewis, thank you very wonderful. Much. Thank you very much. Thank you for those. Uh, we're moving swiftly on to Christine. Thank you. Over to you, Christine. Well, the nice thing about being um, the fourth or the fifth speaker is that many people have said the things that I would like to share, because of course I want to share our, I want to thank our host and hostess and, and the team putting this together. I want to echo uh, some comments that Jaron made at the beginning here, first speaker, about digital twins and the focus on um, twinning the, 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 the combination between the real world and the digital world. Uh, Fiona also made some excellent remarks about the earth and our planet and why it's important. So thanks to all the speakers, I'm going to get us back on time. Um, let me introduce myself. I'm an independent consultant. I've been working in standardization and interoperability for over 30 years. So I feel like one of the gray hairs, um, you know, where I've really, um, I've seen a lot of things that, um, that I regret. 
I've also seen some great successes and achievements. My areas of, of standardization work um, are in interoperability on things that have to do with the earth, um, geospatial uh, uh, standards, such as those in the Open Geospatial Consortium. Um, I co-chair the Points of Interest Working Group, the GeoPose Working Group. Uh, I'm also a secretary in IEEE Standards Working Group on the spatial web. So uh, right now, those are my current activities, ones that I've had the privilege of having the support of Stand ICT over the last uh, uh, period of time. So I think that the impacts are kind of too big to list, too numerous to list, because everybody is on Earth and all disciplines in one way or another um, come back to the planet. Uh, for me specifically, the importance is I work on augmented reality. It's not virtual reality. It deals first with the physical world and that twin of the physical world so that we can detect where the user is, what they're doing, and how to enhance that experience, the one that Jerome was talking about, with digital content that's overlaid in real time. So let me focus and spend more of my time talking about the challenges ahead or the challenges I've seen. There was talk um, earlier about the fact that there are many um, standards that develop in a silo. And while I agree that that can happen, there's the other um, error or a problem that can come up where people don't have a specific real world problem that they're trying to solve. And so I think this is fundamental that we need to address real problems and not invent problems for standardization to, stall, to solve. And sometimes we can identify what that real problem, real world problem is by testing the things in the real world. So a lot of prototyping, I think, should um, be done in advance of standardization. So real um, coding, trying out some solutions and options before um, actually doing the standards work. Another thing is that Many standards are working in isolation, so they lack the community, and that leads to problems with adoption and developer uh, support. So I think those have already been addressed quite a bit by other, by other speakers, and I don't need to repeat that. Um, I'd like to go and talk about what I see as some, some opportunities that this program um, could, could really address. One is to um, have something like an EU ready symbol or um, some way of, of demonstrating that the EU has um, or that some body, some, some group um, believes that um, the values in the European Union and the, um, the, the proper homework has been done on a standard and that then uh, it would be recommended for adoption once it's been reviewed carefully. This is not done by all standards groups. I would also like to highly, highly recommend as part of the EU ready symbol or brand that all standards be tested even after the standard version 0.1 is released or 1.0. We need to make sure that the standards we release can be implemented with, um, with ease. And that may mean doing a lot of work on developer tools, uh, toolkits, publishing code samples. I haven't heard anybody talking about that. And I believe in my field, at least, that's extremely important. And then I don't think we should have standards just because they are good. I think that the baseline goal we should be aiming for is interoperability. Some speakers have spoken about interoperability as a key objective, but I don't think enough was said. And I want to make that a baseline objective, a goal that we're not just putting in standards so everybody has the same tires. It's because we wanna be able to change the tires on the car many times in many cars. So we really need interoperability as the primary goal. And so I hope that's helped uh, to bring to light some other topics that were not covered before. And thank you, Silvana.
Thank you, Christine. That was very succinct. Super. And uh, we've made notes of that. I'm now going to pass on to our final speaker, Suno. Thank you for your patience where we come up to the hour. So I'm going to pass the floor immediately, Suno. Uh, you're, 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 you're mute, Suno. Try again. Yes, Try again. Super. Sorry. Um, yes, I'm here. Suno was with chair of the last 10 years, I think, of, of um, Etsy eHealth. Um, and I chose this slide because it's one, one short illustration of how IoT can be just literally swing into action following a major accident and how it's not one single entity in eHealth, it's a mass of different. Um, of, of different areas of technical ability all coming together to save lives. Uh, I have to move on. Um, so eHealth is not a single entity. It's merging of many information and communication technologies and their attendance standards that work together to provide and constantly improve the provision of health services. eHealth equipment is essentially contextual in healthcare. Wellness and fitness data also form an integral part of our information stream from before the cradle to beyond the grave, as we now add genetics to the diagnostic mix. We view the Green Deal as an important development. Clean air and water are the building blocks of health, and today's ICT standards contribute to their availability. We expect medical devices to be enhanced with greater connectivity, E-health will in, literally envelop IoT, wearables, and the use of AI without making them specifically medical, um, medical devices. We will encourage sustainability and a better understanding of environmental waste uh, versus contamination. There are many areas in which standards could be developed to support the Green Deal and the new industrial policies in Europe. However, there are also challenges to be faced, which we aim to tackle in our technical group. For example, emphasis in the Green Deal is placed on the reuse of equipment and clothing. And whilst many have criticized the overabundant use of single use medical instruments and PPE, few would dispute that strict adherence to single use practice has slowed the spread of the recent pandemic and continues to protect the most vulnerable members of our society. There can be no compromise in health safety, but new ways of reducing the burdens of single, single use need to be found if we're not to turn the clock back and discard the practice. This includes record keeping, storage and transport, areas where IoT has a clear role to play. So technology and health services requires constant updating and improvement to provide ever better care for the patient. In order for this to be effective, technical standards must aid the process. This, for example, will support now new methods of diagnosis, particularly as AI is implemented in areas such as cancer diagnosis, pharmaceuticals, monitoring and control. Examples are too many to enumerate, which is why our group has studied with the support of Stand ICT, a range of generic issues such as use cases and data sharing, which are important to the e-health community but also to the European society in a wider context. Finally, uh, I would add that TCE health discussions on standards always include an awareness of the European respect for human rights, issues that may arise as a result of new technology to be, it to be employed in the health environment. That was less definitely less than five minutes <laughs> it was definitely yes you know i just <laughs> i think I went that's too very fast. kind of you no no you didn't that's but absolutely great it's but it's all there and it's all to be discussed <laughs> indeed just for the benefit of those uh writing the chat that we, we will save the chat but you will have a copy of this particular uh the slide deck that was the only session that does have slides but do remember that we are the the questions that we said we were asking our steam panelists are going to make up part of the report that we do then compile together so all this information will be there and you will have access to this so i'm kindly asking ray if he can if i can eat into five minutes of his um next session that's starting at uh four because we really do need to stretch legs 
uh, just for five minutes. Yeah. So um, I thank all panelists now. That was super, super. And I do uh, apologize for bullying you into uh, finishing on time, but you were great. Not an easy uh, feat with eight of you. It was super. And let's get ready for the next session, 16.05 then, which uh, is a panel in attracting tomorrow's professionals to contribute to standardization. So this will be a nice uh, build up for coming up next. Back in five, everybody. Thanks ever so much so far to all, every single okay. one of you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Don't go. Come back. <laughs> <laughs> Bye. <clears throat>
probably start now in a second, Antonio and Michelle, Francesco. Is, uh, uh, Brian, is Brian online? Cannot. Yes, Ray, how are you? Excellent. Yes. Turn on your screen, uh, Brian. Yeah, you're there. I'm here too. I see you, Vanna, you're there, yes. You've been here all along. <laughs> Okay, uh, we, we, I suppose we can kick off um, with the last session uh, because we're just past the, the five minute coffee break, a uh, leg stretch. Um, yes, wonderful, Ray. I was just gonna, I was gonna introduce you, but you're in already, so that's great. Please, please go ahead, take over. Thank you. I just want to try and keep it to the our, our schedule, so uh, we'll just jump in straight away. Uh, I do. It's really delighted to get this next panel uh, moving. We, uh, some some very distinguished experts: uh, Antonio Conte, Knut Blind, Ivan Mijatovic, Brian McAuliffe, and Michelle Vettervold. And I'll, I'll let each of them introduce themselves um, um, uh, for this particular session, session four. And this is about tomorrow's professionals training the next generation of standardization professionals. So first of all, uh, um, to get the ball rolling as quick as possible, Antonio, can I get you just introduce yourself and just give a little bit of, of background of your area of expertise thank you yeah thank you thank you ray and thank you also for the invitation to participate in this uh, workshop uh, um, i am an official uh, um, in dg grow uh, um, dealing with ict standardization uh, uh, policy and um, in particular uh, i'm also uh, following uh, since uh, um, sometime uh, the uh, initiatives in the area of education and standardization. So uh, this afternoon, I'd just like to, to provide you with a short uh, uh, summary of the Commission uh, views regarding the needs for uh, education in standardization, and uh, I would say also education at large, and, um, and see what could be the possible uh, developments in the near future. I believe that we should start uh, from uh, uh, two key assumptions. The first one is that uh, uh, standardization uh, has uh, um, uh, obtained uh, in the last years more and more importance uh, from a geopolitical uh, and uh, strategic point of view. And uh, its uh, relevance uh, is uh, clearly mentioned um, in a number of uh, policy documents on the Commission. Uh, uh, in particular, I would like to mention uh, the uh, industrial uh, uh, policy uh, strategy and uh, the more recent uh, standardization strategy that, were, that was adopted by the Commission last year. Uh, the second important point, in my view, is the fact that uh, uh, universities uh, are key in shaping the digital transformation and uh, um, make sure that there is a progress in skills development. Um, this has uh, a number of uh, uh, consequences, um, and eventually we can discuss uh, about uh, these consequences uh, later on. Now, given this context, uh, um, uh, the Commission has uh, included uh, in the next uh, um, work program of Horizon Europe um, a couple of relevant uh, um, uh, calls one related to the um, need to uh, promote uh, the creation of uh, um, experts uh, through education in uh, universities and high education institutions. And the second one is related to the need to improve the uh, cooperation and interactions among uh, industry, academia, uh, public sectors, uh, in order to uh, enhance uh, the knowledge valorization uh, in innovation ecosystems. So uh, in the next few minutes, I'd just like to provide you a very general uh, overview of these two calls that uh, uh, are intended to address uh, this specific need related to the role that education can play in standardization and in general. Thanks, Antonio. Uh, just before you get into that, I just get the rest of the panelists to introduce themselves, and then we can go back to to, to talking about the more detail, if that's okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Uh, thanks very much. Can you, can you just give yourself a brief introduction, introduction, and a, a background, please? Yeah. Thank you, Ray. Thanks also for the invitation to this uh, great event. Uh, my name is Knut Blind. I'm a uh, on the one hand, uh, Professor for Innovation Economics at the TU Berlin uh, since 2006 and also teaching since then uh, courses uh, related and focusing on, on standardization. Um, 
Then I'm also head of a business unit called Innovation Regulation at Fraunhofer ISI, uh, doing a lot of kind of uh, research, contract research um, in, in the field uh, of standardization, innovation, and, and, and beyond. And third, I'm uh, also chairman of uh, the, the SEN SENLEC joint working group, their standardization, innovation, and research since its very, very beginning uh, in 2008, that means uh, 15 years. Thank you very much. I stop here, but before I, I make my statements. Right? Okay, Ivana, can you introduce yourself, please, and just give you a bit of background as well? Yes, thank you. I'm Ivana Miatovic. I'm coming from University of Belgrade, and I'm passionate uh, teacher of standardization and ICT standardization at bachelor, master, and PhD studies. And uh, our course, uh, ICT standardization at PhD studies, are uh, quite popular, let's say, and we have uh, a lot of interest interest uh, from abroad. Uh, I am vice president of uh, EURAS, uh, European Academy for Standardization, and I'm uh, responsible for AGES Booster Training Academy, and uh, quite ambitious in that sense. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks very much, Ivana. Brian, can you introduce yourself and your background, please? Yes, thanks, Ray, and hello, uh, everybody. Thanks for the opportunity. So Brian McAuliffe uh, is my name. Uh, in my day job, I lead uh, HP's standardization efforts. Um, and uh, in fulfilling that role, I'm also chair of the of Ireland's National uh, Mirror Committee on ICT standardization. Um, I'm the JTC1 appointed liaison officer to the European Commission. Um, and in the context of today's event, I'm also the chair of the uh, STEM ICT Standards Academy. And more about that later. Fantastic. Thanks, Brian. Uh, Michelle, Michelle, can you introduce yourself and a bit and a bit about your background as well, please? Okay. Um, so my name is Michelle Wetterwald. Um, I am a, an engineer in networking and uh, mobile communications. I have a background in um, industry and research, and that's been very helpful to, to go into standardization. Uh, in the past years, uh, I've focused on uh, standardization at Etsy, and I've had, um, I was one of the authors of the uh, class, of the course uh, uh, written at Etsy uh, that uh, David Boswartik has presented in the second session. Um, and I teach this, uh, this class at, um, um, at the Telecom Paris Executive Education in an IoT uh, certificate, which is the, uh, targeting professionals. Okay. So I think this is most of it. Thanks very much, uh, Michelle. So getting back to Antonio, sorry to break it into you mid stride, Antonio. You were introducing the European Commission DG Grohl's view on standardization education for the next generation of standards professionals. And particularly, you were just about to illustrate the calls, the funding calls that are available to support this initiative. Back to you, Antonio. You're on mute at the moment, Antonio. Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you, Ray, for that. Um, so uh, let's uh, now dive a little bit in these two uh, calls that uh, that have been uh, recently published. Uh, so as I said, uh, there are two, two, two needs here. One is to ensure that uh, uh, universities and uh, higher education uh, uh, institutions uh, promote uh, into their uh, um, curricula um, in courses and teaching in the area of standardization. And the second uh, objective of the second call is about the um, improvement of the relationship between industry and academia and public sector in relation to, um, to knowledge in, in the area of research and standards and so on and so forth. Um, we believe that uh, the, uh, there is a need to increase the number of students uh, that in perspective uh, will be the, 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 the European experts in standardization, since there are more and more challenges in this domain, um, uh, in order to respond essentially to the, 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 the higher relevance of standardization, 
at the political level in Europe, but also at the global level. Um, so we believe that there is a, a need to ensure that universities adapt their activities and uh, offer in relation to uh, education for standardization, and in particular that uh, develop some new uh, uh, innovative uh, teaching uh, concepts of standardization uh, that uh, should be, um, should be um, implemented in the universities. So of course, uh, these uh, innovative teaching concepts uh, should not just cover, uh, um, let's say, uh, technical matters uh, or should not just cover uh, the uh, organization uh, of standardization at the national, European or international level. They should also address uh, the other dimensions uh, where uh, standardization is relevant, and in particular, I would like to underline the fact that standardization has an impact also from uh, a societal uh, perspective. And so this is why it's important to ensure that this new uh, teaching concept uh, will, uh, um, will um, uh, cover and will have a, a, general, a general approach. Um, um, all in all, we believe that this uh, teaching concept should bridge the technical and the societal facets of standardization um, and should demonstrate that at the end of the day standardization is human centric as intended to uh, address the needs of the society at large. Um, of course, these, uh, these activities um, should um, um, take into account uh, the, also the political priorities uh, of, the, of, the, of the Commission, and um, uh, in particular uh, the, the need to develop uh, green and digital skills uh, um, uh, through standardization should be, we expect that will be underlined through this uh, new, new activity. The second, uh, the second uh, um, uh, call uh, it's about uh, the, the interactions between the industry, uh, academia, and the public, uh, and public sector. Uh, in this respect, uh, we believe uh, that there is a need uh, for uh, industry clusters, uh, uh, science and innovation parks uh, to uh, promote uh, collaboration platforms uh, and uh, facilitate the co-creation uh, um, in, in relevant domains. Uh, so we expect that uh, this uh, action uh, will uh, uh, pilot uh, communities of uh, expert facilitators uh, for uh, increasing uh, uh, knowledge exchange and co-creation between uh, the various uh, stakeholders, uh, so the industry, academia, public sectors, uh, etc. And uh, we'll have also to ensure that uh, supply and demand for innovation can be uh, matched. Um, so all in all, the overall objective here is really to, um, to link uh, professionals uh, in the various uh, uh, domains uh, and build communities of uh, facilitators uh, for this uh, co-creation in the various uh, domains. And once again, we believe that once we facilitate this process, uh, there will be certainly um, a positive uh, spillover effect on the, on the various uh, um, communities and in the, in the innovation communities, in the research communities and, um, and the like. So um, in summary, I would, um, would really underline the importance of these two calls. I hope that uh, many of the participants in the workshop uh, will have the possibility to uh, prepare or participate in the calls or to, to work together in order to present the proposals. We have uh, high expectations from uh, these two calls and uh, so we look forward uh, to the submission. And uh, I will stop here for the time being, thank you. Thanks very much, Antonio. And it's brilliant to see the supports that are available. Everybody is recognizing that the importance of the next generation of, of, of standards professionals being educated and, and we'll be able to go into it in a little bit more detail. Knut, just with that in mind, with regard to the higher education institutions, you know, the, the, there's challenges out there in relation to standardization education. Can you kick off the perspective from uh, from your point of view in relation to the higher higher education institutions' challenges for standardization education? You're on mute. Nut. Thank you, Ray, for giving me the, the floor. Um, under the, the joint initiatives, we did two studies. Uh, which uh, kind of revealed uh, several challenges. Now, on the one hand, there is certainly a demand for, for experts in the field, 
Uh, in Germany, we have around uh, 35,000 experts uh, active at DIN, and at the, uh, the European level, it should be around 150,000, just in the former bodies. Yeah? And, and, uh, and this, this uh, demand uh, goes up because these people are um, uh, quite, quite more senior. Yeah? Therefore, uh, several are going to retire and will disappear. And therefore, we have to to really fill the pipeline with, with new people, that, that means that's there. Um, uh, and, and therefore we need these people with, with, with competencies in standardization. Um, and um, on the other hand, we need people who have both hard and soft competencies. Uh, that means a technical and, and non-technical, these maybe social and, and societal uh, uh, competencies are needed. Uh, and uh, on the other hand, what, what we reveal is that um, the, the, the market, market participants are not really happy with what has been provided so far in the past regarding education in these fields. Um, that means there's a gap. And this, this gap is going to increase. Yeah? The number of students in Germany is shrinking. Uh -huh. and, uh, and we have already kind of problems to, to get sufficient uh, students uh, in, the, in this area. Uh, we, are, we, 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 are, we, are, we are fighting and, and and I think uh, we, are, we are also successful, but this is a challenge. Huh? And, uh, and therefore we have to also to kind of, um, kind of uh, exploit the synergies with that there between education research, but also to, to the, the active contribution to standards, uh, standardization work. And this is, this is important. Uh, multidisciplinarity is, is an issue um, because uh, still we have more disciplinary kind of yeah, structured um, yeah, programs. Uh, the, the scientific disciplines are more, more kind of yeah, focused on their own core, not not so much interdisciplinary. That that's an issue, and um, and therefore it's it's not so easy for for teachers, professors to to bring this topic into into the curricula, uh, and uh, and therefore we also need um, the, the 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 signal from from the market. Uh, that there is a need uh, that that we, we are endorsed to to continue to expand our activities and therefore I appreciate very much the the, the European standardization strategy which really uh, in one pillar focus on on this this need also from the policy perspective what has been uh, said before by Antonio uh, also uh, now recently driven by by geopolitical de developments I stop here now in the chat you find the the two reports which have been uh, released related to this before Thanks. I talk about the recommendations, what should we do, done. Thanks very much, Knut. And like, so just to pick up on that point then, and maybe I, I'd ask Michelle, I mean, what's the best approach to this? Like, should we be educating um, within the university environment? Like, so, so young people to at maybe undergraduate master's uh, PhD level, or should we bring in professionals, you know, from industry and training them and upskilling them? What, what's your view on that, Michelle? You're on mute as well, Michelle. Yes, I was muted. Okay, so um, as I mentioned before, I'm teaching to um, to professionals, and I think this is uh, this is very positive because uh, they they already have a career objective, they have a professional background, and they have already used standards, so they are very focused on what uh, standardization may bring. But uh, you, you need to have um, you need to find, uh, I would say, the, the number of students, and uh, it, it's not it's not that easy. But this is also this is very important to to teach the, the current professionals how to bring their their uh, uh, what have created to standardization. Um, on the other hand, you may have um, uh, you may have um, uh, more professionals. Uh, um, uh, educated if you bring it to the universities, because in the university you may have a set, uh, a larger set of students. And uh, I think this is also important. So I think that the education, this education should have two, two directions in both in, in the uh, high um, HEI, but also in the professionals. And this has to be developed very strongly because it means an. Um, an involvement uh, uh, from the industry, from the different stakeholders, to teach their professionals, to, to get them diverted from their uh, uh, daily activities 
and attend some classes and be part also of standardization, which uh, which is uh, you know it is taking quite some time of their of their professional activity. Thanks very much, uh, Michelle. And we have we're very lucky to have representatives from two CSAs here at the moment. We have both both Ivana and and Brian who are, represent uh, HS Booster and Stand ICT uh, academies uh, res uh, respectively. So Brian, maybe go to you first and just say well, but what's what's the US Academy's role here and like, you know, and maybe what challenges are exist from your perspective? Yeah, <clears throat> thanks, Ray. Um, yeah, maybe just before I jump into that, just reflecting on, on the last couple of comments on um, the need for, you know, education in general. I mean, when you think about the, uh, the people that we meet at most standards meetings, the same people seem to pop up everywhere, okay? And the introduction to this panel talks about having a robust and sustainable pool of professionals uh we're, we're getting older we're getting grayer and so we really do need to um start bringing in people at, at the bottom end there are some on the call today of course and but uh it, it is a problem um and, and i think part of that from the industry perspective is it's not a credible career path um and i think we by doing the work we're doing here and working with industry to or sorry with academia to create Incredible third level courses that will, you know, it's a kind of a symbiotic thing that will, that will go on there. Um, but, but jumping on to the um, Stand ICT Standards Academy and, and the, the CSA that I'm chairing. So essentially, we're a group of standardization experts. Um, unlike the other technical working groups under Stand ICT that last, you know, for a short sprint period, um, the Standards Academy is, is running for, for two, three years. Um, and essentially, what we're doing is creating a portal um, through which anybody who's interested in uh, learning about standardization can find content suitable to their level and their interest areas. So we're pulling together a repository of all the already published um, education and training material that's there. Uh, we're not creating any new material. And I know Ivana and HS Booster will talk about that um, later. Okay, we are focused on ICT standardization, but there's many aspects of that that are common to both ICT and non-ICT. For example, how the standards development process works. So um, we were about 15 people. We're, we're from uh, academia, we're from industry, we're from uh, European Commission, we're from the societal stakeholders like ECOS, ANEC, ETUC, um, and uh, we meet once a month and we, um, you know, we, we try and advance the, the portal. Uh, what we're the plan at the moment is by March to have all the content that we know about loaded in. And in April, May time, we'll be um, running a, an event where we'll, I guess, formally kind of launch the, uh, the academy um, and some sort of webinar or, or dissemination event. Um, so that's roughly, in a nutshell, Ray, what the Academy uh, is about. Um, and Ivana, I, I, Brian did a quick intro to you there in terms of HS Booster, because HS Booster is more, more towards uh, bespoke um, uh, standardization training material. Do you want to just introduce what's, what, what the, uh, what's happening in HS Booster and, the, and some of the challenges that are, that are addressed? Yes, in hsbooster.eu, our task is to develop efficient mechanism for training researchers. So basically, our target audience are researchers, but uh, what is the problem? We have focused uh, at a specific uh, target audience, but our ta uh, target audience uh, are not uh, homogeneous. So we have plenty of disciplines and uh, some critical for EU and some uh, are not so critical, but on the other side, AHS Booster Training Academy uh, is practically a concerted effort of many experts, professionals, academics and researchers, and we are preparing uh, ready to use material, compilation of material uh, to raise or to uh, increase some structure to have better structure on that, uh, because uh, we are service uh, for the project. So we are not in general, we, our service is not in general, but we are a training academy with main focus on uh, services of the hsbooster.eu project. On the other side, what is main, uh, let's say challenge in this academy, it is basically 
uh, let's say, uh, it takes whole village to raise a child. So basically, I think that uh, the main critical success factor of our training academy is to bring together academics, researchers, uh, standardization professionals and standardization experts. So I hope and we are covering standardization from idea to impact. And we are not focused only on standard development. And our task is to explain as much as possible uh, uh, what impact and what researchers can expect from participating in standardization development and use of standard. Thank you. Thanks very much, Ivana. Uh, and yes, and also that the HS Booster team, they, it's it's not just an ICT support action, it's actually, yeah. it's, it's authorizing your fund of projects. And actually, while, you, while you're speaking, uh, Ivana, because you have, you're a full professor in the University of Belgrade, so you have a, you're steeped in, in education background as well. So uh, how, what do you think is a, a good way of trying to engage better with the higher education uh, institutes and standardization? You know, because we're looking to educate more professionals, educate more students, but we want to try and do it at scale. So what's the best, how, how, what ways can we better engage with HEIs? Uh, there is no one way. I think that uh, it is quite uh, difficult to define only one way. But uh, I will just uh, took one digression uh, for your question and said higher education is facing some challenges, uh, very important, like artificial intelligence and uh, uh, Generation Z. Uh, after COVID situation, we have new generation, very specific generation now on our studies. So digital aspects of all is starting to be very, very important. And uh, right away, I think that uh, if we want to engage uh, more, uh, high, uh, more, more higher education institution in uh, standardization uh, education, it is not only student and it is not only teachers, uh, program managers, uh, managers, university management, and uh, it is a decision maker, program managers, uh, decision makers in higher education as well as uh, higher levels are very important. And I think that uh, these two calls, especially these calls uh, are related to a uh, new, uh, new uh, work program uh, of uh, Horizon Europe are very, uh, very influential. And I think just this call raise issue in last few months, very, very high. Thanks very much, Ivana. And actually, look, we have, I, I'm going to put the same perspective uh, to Knut and to Brian as well. Knut, maybe if you could ask, like, in terms of engaging or collaborating, increase collaboration at, at the SDO or national standards bodies level, get, maybe you'd want to maybe take that one for education and scale. Um, yeah, indeed. Um, uh, I just want to kind of uh, endorse that the, also the, the EU strategy is, is an important point and now the, 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 the courts. Um, uh, what, what's also maybe a, an issue is to, to consider is that um, the, the institutions, uh, the higher education institutions, might really expand their, their um, criteria for promoting people. It means uh, this has been mentioned before. It's not only about writing uh, scientific papers or, or filing patents. Uh, it might be also about uh, in getting involved in standardization. And here uh, we are currently discussing the issue of authorship um, because it's not, in some countries it's possible, in, in other it's not, but uh, here um, we, we, we negotiate in Germany. And the other, the other um, aspect is that in Germany, the, the big, um, research organizations like Max Planck, Fraunhofer, Helmholtz, and Leibniz have negotiated with the research ministries at the federal and the, and the, and the regional level that now um, also, uh, in addition to publications and patents, uh, the involvement of uh, standardization is, an, is another kind of key performance indicator. And now these organizations started to, to collect this information. And this is really a, a game changer. Yeah, um, because um, you have to change the, the, the incentives and the rationals within the organizations, otherwise it's really difficult. Yeah? But this takes time, yeah? therefore um, good to have the strategy, good to have the project, but um, 
uh, we won't see a, a, a fast success. That means we need a long-term support and a long-term strategy uh, towards this. Uh, it's, it's, it's not sufficient to have three years project. I think we have maybe a 10 years vision how to, to, uh, to improve that and also maybe to compete with, with other big players in the world in, in order to be uh, then at the end, maybe in, in 10 years time at, at a much kind of better shape than, than we are currently compared uh, to, to, to other countries and also their investment in, uh, in uh, international, especially international standardization, also to, to kind of really as uh, yeah, save the European values, maybe to assure also technological sovereignty, which is also mentioned in the, in the, uh, in the strategy, uh, means these are very important aspects. And uh, um, next, next week we will talk in Firenze about this talk with Dick Weiler and others. Thank you. Thanks very much, Knutia. Very important, that the, the, particularly the sustainability aspect of it, that we that we don't just go from from say say call to call. You know that we need to have sort of a longer term approach. To this I think, but I think, but what what the commission is doing at the moment is putting a, a framework in place for actually doing that via these calls, which is an excellent starting point. And uh, Brian, just in, in terms of engaging with industry, you know your thoughts on that. You're an industry professional, so uh, what can we do there? Better improve uh, for collaboration, etc. <clears throat> yeah, like just a couple of points on that, Ray. Um, like I think we all know that you know in in many sectors, industry um, is heavily involved working with government and academia to develop uh, content and curricula in areas that they believe will produce professionals that benefit industry. Um, so so that model is something I believe that will if, if uh, deployed, would also help industry get on board with standards education. And, you know, what just one area as an example, you know, we, we all know that um, standardization helps bridge that gap between, you know, innovation, research and market adoption. Um, I don't think industry know that very well. Um, and I think it behoves academia plus SDOs and all of us to create compelling examples, case studies, content that show how standards can bridge that gap. And that then, in turn, will get uh, industry on board. Uh, and related to that, then, when they are on board, I think they should be um, encouraged to let their experts, who, you know, in standardization, you know, like us around the table, help, with, help academia with developing the content and delivering on a contract basis, you know, uh, classes uh, with, with real industry experience. Um, and the second point I'd like to make is that um, and it was relates back to what I mentioned earlier about standardization not being a, a credible a career path. Um, somehow we need to get standardization as a, a milestone, a tick box uh, on the pathways adopted, say, by professional associations of engineers. You know, if you want to become a chartered or a fellow or whatever, you have to tick a few boxes. And one of them should be some third level um, uh, element of standards education. Yeah. Excellent, excellent points, actually, Brian. Yes, brilliant. Um, and then uh, uh, last on this, well, not last, it, it last of this sort of uh, team anyway, on how best to, to engage and, and potentially to maybe better approaches at teaching standardization. Just want to engage with Michelle, um, because Michelle has some experience like learned from like various uh, Etsy conferences that she's been involved in, etc. Like you know, on on approaches for teaching at standardization as well. Michelle, do you want to just quickly pick up on, on that point as well? Um. Yeah, um, you know, when we presented the first uh, teaching material, uh, uh, the first version of the teaching material we developed at Etsy, uh, we held a conference and at that conference we learned that uh, uh, in other regions of the world, there are some uh, universities which are fully dedicated to graduating uh, standardization professionals. Um, uh, as we just, dis uh, we just heard, it might be difficult for um, let's say industry and different stakeholders like research to divert professionals from their activities. So when we, we created this mater our material, we, we prefer to consider uh, uh, it as one module, part of a, a, a master level degree. Uh, this is what we have done. But um, uh, uh, as, I, as I said, uh, the, this class was also very suitable to teach professionals. And uh, even more in my case, uh, as I teach in Telecom Paris, uh, where I have French students, 
Um, and the class is written in English. I, could, I can even teach it in French because it's easy to translate. It's very, lot of pictures and so on. Um, oh, an additional thing uh, that I would like to say is that if you consider it as a, a, a module in, a, a, let's say, in a broader um, uh, curriculum, like, uh, for example, we have IoT, um, you, you have also to consider in the, uh, this uh, curriculum the development of soft skills. We have heard about soft skills before, but this is, uh, I think this is uh, the same as knowing the process, knowing the, uh, how to, to write the standard and so on. It is very important that the students, they know, um, they have good, very good skills in language, because when you are uh, developing standards in English, you have to be able to speak and to write in English. And very often you see people who are not understandable and uh, it's, it makes the standards longer to develop. You have to have skills like uh, self-organization, um, socializing and things like that. So I think that when you consider a, a curriculum in standardization, you have to consider also developing these soft skills. Yes. Thanks very much, Michelle. Um, I, I want to go to Antonio to ask about, you know, potentially reducing silos and, you know, bigger collaboration and his view on coordination and that. But just briefly, Knut wanted to just get back, back in, I think is on the on the education um, question first. Go ahead, Knut. Just one minute, Knut. Yeah. Okay. Uh, just what I forgot, indeed, and what has been mentioned is the, the close partnership with the National Standards Body is, is, is certainly uh, recommended because uh, there are uh, resources experts and uh, and the exchange is, is really very valuable and uh, we have kind of signed a, a collaboration contract uh, regarding this uh, within 15 years ago that means also the long term issue is is here again again uh, uh, to to be mentioned i come back regarding the high level expert group in, in the last maybe comment later Okay, perfect. Uh, in the takeaway, um, and just Antonio, just we were talking uh, about reduction in silos and the decreasing duplication, increasing collaboration, get more of a consensus going, more more engagement, and, and, and more of an ecosystem building approach to 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 uh, regulations and standardization. So, do you want to just uh, spend a minute or two just talking about that, and then we'll have the wrap up, uh, thirty seconds wrap up from everybody. Yeah, certainly this is a key point, and um, probably we we have to think on a new new instruments that we could use first of all uh, to raise awareness in industry regarding the relevance of education uh, in uh, in general and in standardization in particular. I also like to underline that uh, we have just set up a, a high level forum on standardization, uh, where we intend to discuss all uh, high and key political issues related to standardization. And um, certainly education will be one of the topics that will be addressed in this framework. And hopefully also this high level forum should give us some, uh, some uh, inputs regarding the possible measures that uh, could be undertaken. But certainly I believe that also the European standards organizations could play a role. So at the end of the day, they bring together uh, industry representatives and uh, all the other stakeholders uh, in uh, in, um, in, the, in the standardization domain. So through their coordination, probably there is a possibility to ensure that uh, um, some level of duplication and, uh, and um, parallel initiatives could be reduced. So in a way, I would see also a role for the SOs in this, in this domain. Okay, thanks very much, Antonio. And just uh, we have a couple, maybe thirty seconds each for a takeaway comment from each of you. I want to I want to thank uh, everybody for, for for engaging. But before before we wrap up, just thirty seconds. Last takeaway comment, Michelle. I'll go to you first. Uh, then Brian. Then Ivana. Then uh, Knut, And then Antonio. So Michelle, uh, thirty seconds. Okay. So um, from what I from what I take here is that. Um, um, there is not one method to teach standardization. We have seen that there are plenty of methods and we need to trigger the, the involvement of, um, uh, of resources from the different stakeholders uh, at their level for, for long term and not, not only uh, for two or three years. Okay, thank you very much, Michelle. Brian, take away a comment. Uh, thanks, Ray. Yeah, yeah, mine is a, a request, actually, or a pitch. So I posted the link in the chat there to the, uh, I'm going to call it the Draft Academy. 
um, please take a look and uh, see if you find it useful or if you see glaring um, problems, issues or things missing from it. We'd, we'd love to hear your feedback. Thanks. You're on mute, Ray. Ray, you are silent. Apologies. <laughs> Mike, Mike, I caught myself. Ivana, you're next. Uh, so for attracting uh, tomorrow's standardization professionals, we need joint efforts of academia, uh, standardization experts, standardization professionals, industry, and of course, uh, European Commission. Thank you very much, Ivana. Uh, Knut, take away a comment. Um, yeah, just one. Uh, regarding the, the high-level expert form, um, here, uh, I appreciate that the topic of standardization is on the agenda. Um, but I, I, I would also recommend that um, uh, the, the relevant stakeholders are uh, represented to, uh, to really kind of bring in their experiences related uh, uh, to this topic and also especially the challenges so far. I, I see the organization a little bit industry biased. Thank you. Thanks very much, Knut. And Antonia, I give you the last words from the European Commission, your takeaway comment. Are you yeah, here? thank you. Thank you. Um, I believe that um, all the, the previous uh, suggestions and proposals are absolutely um, correct and fine. I believe that there is also uh, a the need for a even stronger political uh, support to the need to ensure this, uh, this approach. And uh, certainly this, uh, this is something that uh, will have to be discussed at a higher political level uh, at, um, at the national level, I guess, but also at the European level. So it, it's important to get also this political backup for whatever initiative uh, will be launched. Fantastic. Last and but not least, I just want to thank everybody. Thanks to all our panelists, to Antonio Conte, Knut Blind, Ivana Miatovic, Brian McCullough, and Michelle Vatterfold. And according to my timer, we're bang on schedule, 40 minutes. Thanks very much, guys. Take care. Wonderful. Thank you, Ray. Thank you, panelists. That was an extremely uh, useful uh, session. I, I wrote in the chat, I wanted to give an opportunity also to the participants online to ask any questions. We would open the microphone for anybody. And I did suggest uh, any hands up or to write the chat here uh, if you'd like to. I, I don't see any uh, hands up at the moment. Nothing in there. Nothing, nothing there. I want to give a minute or so for, for people to... Uh, um... Whilst, okay, whilst you do sort of mull over any question, we wanted to uh, obviously thank you uh, for all these insights that we've been busily uh, including in, in the report. And before I forget, but before people come off, uh, we've added a glossary of reading. We've seen some wonderful URLs in the chat uh, where you've pasted um, excellent reading that we if we haven't read we should so at the end of the report the infamous report that we're going to pull out of this these three hours we'll add the glossary of reading at the end so this is uh super i i want to say now i'd like to thank obviously from, um, from the european commission side helen thomas carlos antonio gergo Rachele. Emilio and Reca, um, you're always so great. And it's always a, a pleasure having your insights uh, from the European Commission. And I think if Stan ICT and the other efforts uh, have the visibility we do have, it's down to you and your support to us. So I'd like to thank that. Thanks to the consortium DCU Australo Trust uh, and Compla. And behind the scenes, there's Francesca, Maria and Patricia who have you don't, don't see, but they've basically been doing all the legwork uh, on here. And with that, I would suggest, uh, Maria, you sh show the main takeaways um, that we've um, quickly put together. Uh, now, clearly, these aren't all of them, but uh, there's quite a lot on here that we've tried to pull out during the three hours um that are going to make up part of the report too uh, i don't want to go through um all of them here but i think there there's the things that grabbed our attention obviously and this always comes up for the research sector the whole point around incentives and recognition this comes up all the time in any uh aspect that we're discussing so that really needs 
uh, to be consolidated. And, you know, thanks also the efforts that uh, Sen Senelec, Olivia, you mentioned uh, before. Communities around standardization uh, is key. The participation requires passion, practical support, okay, and the visibility of progression in addressing uh, challenges. We then um, heard about removing duplication, um, that knowledge is extremely hard to standardize in the context of the digital twins. Um, key challenges is managing to combine efforts in Europe, creating a common basis uh, to the future forward, how digital standards will be developed and, and used. Um, you might remember it was interesting, the, the point around real problems and trying not to invent problems for standardization to solve. Uh, Christine, I think you raised that point. And I think this is where we were trying to go also with our success, our success stories page, Understand ICT. Um, the idea of an EU ready symbol or brand um, and the importance of uh, making sure that when we release the standards that they've gone through a significant um, area of, of testing. So toolkits, tool sampling, coding, um, prompting interoperability standards as a baseline goal. And then for the last session, universities are key in shaping the digital transformation. Um, there's no simple way to engage higher education institutions in standardization that a long term strategy is needed. And finally, in order to get industry on board, it's important that professionals are involved as instructors uh, and share their experience via teaching activities. So clearly this is not a non-exhaustive list, but we did want to put something uh, here for you. And I think with this, We've, I think we're, uh, <laughs> that, I think that could be a wrap. <laughs> if you're not following San ICT, then you should be. Uh, there's just the ninth open call that closes on the 15th of February. We did write this in the chat, so you still have time. Um, we're pleased to announce the continuation of San ICT 2026, but I mean, that began also this January. Um, so there are more calls going on uh, in the future, and we're going to make sure we fine tune anything that we're not happy with what's going on in Stanley City 2023. Uh, we love the enthusiasm that uh, you all bring to the table, and I think this is just the start of many um, more inclusive discussions going on uh, in the coming weeks and months. And so uh, with that, thank you so much, all of you. Round of applause, really, you've been fantastic. Thank you to our moderators and our, and our panelists. And we have our work cap out for us um, in pushing out this concise report ready for the, for the 20th. So we, we would like feedback on it, but clearly we, we need to see how to do that because um, feedback has to be sort of within 24 hours. But um, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get there. Thanks once again. Have a great afternoon. Thanks for your time. And thanks for many of you staying, sticking till the end. We know it's not easy um, with very all busy schedules. And uh, have a wonderful start to 2023. Thank you so much.